hands, Walter. We do jazz hands, Jeff. I'm doing jazz hands with just one hand because I'm holding the phone in my other hand. We're live from the Big Daddy Gun Studios. I'm Hank Strange. Joining me tonight, we have a very special guest, Jeff Quinn of Gun Blast. Gunblast.com, that's his YouTube channel, but he also has a blog by the same name, coincidentally, Gun Blast. Actually, gunblast.com. So, and we, we also have Walter Keller here with us tonight. I want to say what's up to everyone out there. I hope you guys have your big girl panties on tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to get to talk to Mr. Quinn. I, I call him Gun Blast. And uh, we're going to go over a whole bunch of things. So I want to thank everyone for joining us live. We've got a bunch of folks here in the chat as well as uh, just watching us. I want to encourage everyone here at the top of the show to click that like button. Make sure you're subscribed to us and also share this on social media with your friends and family so they know what we have coming on. They know that we have Gun Blast himself here tonight. And uh, let's jump into this and get it going. Uh, Walt, first of all, Walter, what's up with you, man? You good? Uh, just a typical Monday, you know? Okay, all right, cool. Okay, so Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so you know, um, just so the folks know out there, you, uh, you know, you are low tech, right? Even though you're on the the interwebs. <laughs> I am. I live out in the woods, and our, our internet signal out here is really weak. I got satellite, but it's real slow, and uh, so I don't have any anything I can do any streaming or anything like that out here. But I enjoy living out in the woods. I like it a lot better than, than living amongst a bunch of people. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I don't blame you. You know, and look, we can still make it happen. This uh, telephone technology, <laughs> you know, we're still making it happen, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, first of all, um, I want to ask you, man, how you feeling? How you doing? I'm doing pretty well for an old guy. Not okay. bad at all. Okay, good, good. You know, um, now for folks out there, for the few gun guys, I don't know what kind of gun guys out there haven't heard of you. For the uh, few gun guys who have not heard of Gun Blast, um, can you tell us how you first, I, I'm assuming that you've always been in guns your whole life, right? I have, yeah. I got interested in guns when I was just, well, before I was a teenager. Uh, started shooting guns, got my first shot going when I was 11 years old, and got my first hand going when I was 16, and uh, just always been interested in guns. I love them. They fascinate me. You know, a lot of times people accuse me of, uh, I've never seen a gun I don't like. Of course, I have my favorites like everybody else does. But, you know, if a bullet comes out of the bore and goes where I want it to go, I pretty much like it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I have seen that out there. But why is that a bad thing to like guns, man? I, you know, I think you're genuinely a gun guy. You love you love guns for just being guns, right? Sure. Well, you know, a lot of people, they expect me to hate on a gun. But, but I don't, you know. I, I tell the manufacturers that send us guns for review, you know, we're going to report every problem. If there's a malfunction, we're going to report it. But you know, a lot of times it's not the gun's fault. We try to discover what makes it malfunction. We're not out there to dog anybody's gun. You know, I think the more guns, the better. The more manufacturers, the better. The more choices consumers have when they go pick out a gun. You know, it's never been a never been a better time in my life to buy a gun. You know, prices right now are, are good. It's a buyer's market. You know, uh, uh, the world's flooded with ARs now that are cheap and plentiful, and it's just a it's a good time if you want to own a gun. Right, absolutely. Now, I've been watching your show for a long time, even before I started uh, my own YouTube channel, and um, I see you say it all the time. It seems to me like when folks, uh, when the gun companies send you a T and E, you never really send it back, right? You always buy those guns. Well, you sometimes I send them back, you know, especially if something I've got duplicates of. But it's so much easier to just uh, call in my credit card number or send them a check and hand the box up a gun. Drive forty miles to town to take it to FedEx and ship it off. Just might as well just keep it. Yeah, so so your so your library has to be huge. How how long have you been doing this? When did you guys start doing gunblast.com? We started in the year two thousand on writing about guns. We started our website, just the online gun magazine. And we discovered it's real easy. You know, we can put up, you know, thirty or forty good pictures if you can click on them, make them bigger and it just uh well, starting out, a lot of people didn't think a, a magazine online was going to work, but a lot of the manufacturers, they was going to right off the bat and saw what the future was. Then, I guess about 2008, we started doing videos. You know, I asked 
my brother runs a website for me. Like you said, I'm kind of low tech. I said, Bo, can we, can we do videos? And he said, well, yeah. I said, well, that's something, you know, the paper magazines can't do. Let's do it. So we started doing videos at that time, and uh, it's just been growing ever since. I think we got uh, uh, about 740 videos on YouTube right now. It was wow. up plus uh, over, uh, well over probably 1,200 articles on our website. A little bit over time. Everything we write stays there forever. So. Yeah. I mean, if you start, wow. So, you, if you were not the first, you were one of the few, uh, the first blogs, like gun blogs, actually on the internet then. Yeah, I think it's right. It's uh, worked out really well for us. Okay. Uh, when I started this, and I didn't even have a computer, but my brother was into computers. And, and I asked him, I said, if I can write about guns, can you put it on the internet thing? He said, he said, yeah, I can do that. And I was a window contractor at the time. But then 2012, I got so busy on the guns, I had to choose one or the other. It wasn't a hard choice. I dropped the contracted thing and, and went, went on this full time. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. So that you guys were go doing it for a while. Now, I don't think everyone out there knows this, but you're kind of like a team effort, right? A gun blast. We are. Well, I'm just I'm just a pretty face and a trigger puller. Uh, I do the, the shooting and, and I write about it. And put my my brother Bo. He does all the high tech stuff. He runs the website, produces the videos, and that kind of thing. Plus, we got a Older brother, he handles egg sales for us. It's, he don't get involved in the writing or production thing. He just uh, uh, makes sure the money keeps coming in. Right, yeah. Mostly I see Bogue. How's Bogue doing? I'm sorry, what? I, I said uh, I, I usually see Bogue. I think I've seen your other brother maybe once or twice. Yeah. So how's Bogue yeah, doing? He goes to the shows too, but he, he's usually not with us. Bogue stays with me so we can do video and thing from the show. You know, a lot of people like that. They like our show coverage worked out really well. We started covering Chop Chow in the year 2000, and uh, we have people that uh, have been following it ever since, and it's just a, it's a good way to show people things that are out there. You know, used to, paper magazines and before we had the internet, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I'd wait till April or May before I could, could see the things that was just coming out here for that year, you know, read the paper magazines and see what was introduced to the shop, and now we can, we can bring it live, and a lot of other people are doing it now, too. It's, a, it's just a good time to get information out there. Right, absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, I think so. In all these years since two thousand, you've been going to Shot Show, or is that correct? Wow, <laughs> that's the first year I went too. Yeah, uh, Walter says that's the first year he went. Um, wow, that's that's a long time, man. How was Shot Show back in the olden days? <laughs> well, it was uh, it was uh, much like it is now. You know, used to there would be a lot of new introductions at SHOT Show. Uh, now, most of the gun companies, they introduce things a, a few weeks before SHOT. Very few surprises anymore at SHOT Show, like it used to be. And when I dress a little better now, I used to go just, you know, looking like a, a long-haired biker. But uh, now I look like a long-haired old biker. But that's about, <laughs> about the only difference. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Like you said at the top of the show, you're the extremely sexy, good-looking brother. So that's and how... Yeah, that's how you wind up being the front man for the band, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how how long have you had this look? Because your look is signature. I think even people who aren't gun guys, you know, probably recognize that look. So how long have you had the uh, and the look? And for the folks that are listening to this um, on audio only, you know, Jeff is famous for his beard, which is braided, right? Well, sort of when I, I've always had a beard since, uh, I think I quit shaving in 1978. So ever since then I've had a beard. I started riding a motorcycle in 92, and, and I found that if I didn't braid it, it would get all tangled up. I'd spend the hard trying to untangle the things. Braided it works really well for me. I just, just keep it braided and, uh, you know, I'll take it down about, uh, oh, usually on Sunday mornings I'll take it down and, uh, and rebraid it so it's not getting too scraggly looking. And, uh, uh, I have to keep it that way. If I don't, if I let it just go loose, I, I get it caught in everything now. Right. Okay. So this is so you've had this going on for a while. What does uh, Mrs. Gunblast think about the the beard action? Well, she loves the beard. I mean, what, you know, when we got married, I guess nineteen seventy nine. I decided I was going to clean up, so I trimmed it back to about two inches. And I thought for when we showed up for the wedding, she wasn't going to marry me. <laughs> I, started, I started started shaving because of her dad. I was 17 years old, went down there to pick her up one day and 
just hung a little fuzz on my face. Didn't shave that day, you know. And he just retired out of the Army 22 years, drill sergeant and all that stuff. He didn't say nothing to me. He told me, he said, you tell that boy don't ever come back till he shaves. And I ain't shaved since, you know. Yeah, so that was kind of like your rebellion, right? That was it, yeah. I was going to be talking Yeah, yeah. You know, he should have, like, so if he would have told you, listen, you should just keep growing that beard, you would have gone the opposite direction? Probably so. I was, I was a, a smart teenager and wasn't going to listen to anybody, you know? Mm-hmm. So it seems like you guys have probably been married, like, how long have you guys been married now? We've been married uh, 38 years. It will be in December. Wow. She's on the girl every day to really start to take her when I was 15 years old at high school. For well, I got the one. I better stick with her. Yeah. You know, uh, like whenever um, whenever I think about you and, and the lifestyle, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of questions. I want to invite everyone out there to uh, ask you questions, hit us up with stuff that they want to that they want to know about you. But whenever I think about you, you know, you're the real deal. Like what we see, that's genuinely who you are. Unless, you know, unless you're like really, you know, just a New Yorker and then you're putting on this accent, but I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, never been to New York. Uh, well, well, not New York City. I've been up to Hillian for the Remington factory, places like that. But I've always managed to avoid those big cities if I can. They just don't think that'd work out well for me. You've never you've never stepped on uh, New York in uh, in Manhattan. No, never. Wow. Well, I've okay. been there for a couple times. She likes to go up on New Year's Eve when they drop that big ball and all that stuff in Times Square, but that ain't for me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're missing anything. <laughs> yeah. 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 To do a reality reality show or something like that, you know, since you're all the time. Yeah, I get calls all the time. The last lady that called me was I guess about two months ago. She called from LA, and and yeah, you know, just tell people right off, I don't want to do a reality show. But she started in. She said, I got a great idea. We want you to go up to Alaska and live for a year off the grid and build a cabin and all that stuff. <laughs> I told her, I said, lady, I, I love the grid. You know, I work hard to pay my grid bill every month. I love air conditioning and ice, hot showers, and all that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> I already live in the woods, so there's no need to go up there. She said, well, we're going we're gonna to buy 20 acres, and we'll give it to you when it's over. I told her, I said, I've already got about 300 acres more than I need now. I said, thank you, but no thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to knock Alaska. I'm sure we have folks out there that watch us in Alaska. But <laughs> what, what would you do, you know, it, it, like in a part of Alaska where you're 100 percent off the grid. That's yeah. So just because of the way you look, it's a, it's a, go it's ahead. A beautiful place, but you got two seasons up there. You got wood cutting season and wood burning season. So you spend <laughs> all the warm weather trying to cut enough wood so you don't freeze to death in the winter time. It's just not for me. Yeah. So that that's interesting. Um, how did they come to that conclusion that that would be a good idea to try to get you to go to Alaska? You've been, I'm assuming you've been know. there before, right? I'm Maybe in the summer. People call them different ideas about reality shows. You know, reality shows, it's, it's the wrong name. For them. They're not real. All they want is drama. Like, they, you know, they're always asking me, we want to, you know, you know, video what you do. And I told them, so, you know, 90% of what I do is just boring. I'm shooting holes in paper and making notes and chronographing loads. That ain't what they want. They want, they want drama and people fighting and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's I think a lot of people don't realize a lot of what you see in reality shows is manufactured. Um, so since the Duck Dynasty guys took off, did the interest in getting you on reality shows kick up? I don't know. It seemed like it's been pretty steady for several years. So it died off there for a little while when uh, you had the, that show, you know, where the, uh, oh, the Sons of Guns, where the guy got in trouble, you know, for molesting his daughters and crap. Yeah, and yeah. Then, uh, but... Uh, major networks backed off for a little bit there, but since then I've had both History Channel and Discovery Channel for her. She called me when to start on something. I'm, I'm pretty happy doing what I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you're putting, obviously you're putting on your own show, right? So, you yeah, know. Pretty and much. We have just, just the visuals and things, but I, I enjoy this show. I, I have to travel a lot now. I go to 
go to gun site uh, as often as they can in Arizona and go to different gun factories. And it's still really interesting. And there's one company that wants me to go to Italy this next spring and, and visit some gun factories, but I'm not sure if I want to do that or not. But I've always had a rule. I don't go anywhere that I can't eventually walk home. I don't believe I can walk home from Italy. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a very wet walk. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> not a good swimmer. Yeah, you know, not that I mean, I, I think Italy would be would be nice to go there. You know, the Italians uh, make obviously some fine guns. I'm not sure I how much. I, I don't know how many of the guns that they all manufacture they can actually own. I, I think you can have guns, obviously, in Italy, but it's not easy, right? That's correct. That's one of here. Yeah. Um, so, go, hold on a second, Walter. You have a question? No, uh, no. Most of them are non-military, non-military calibers. Yeah, Walter is saying that uh, most of the guns that they have are non-military calibers. So that's correct. Yeah. Um, so now let me see. Hold on here. I've got a few questions that are coming in. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna uh, Joe Carpenter wants to know how did you come up with the term uh, air quote social work when describing what a gun is good for? <laughs> oh, just a couple of years ago, it just you know a gun is. Uh, when you need a gun, it's a bad social situation if you're using it for defensive purposes. And, and that's just a, a nice way to put it. You know, instead of saying you're going to blow a hole in somebody, you just use a gun to uh, to solve an untasteful social situation. Yeah. I think, you know, when, when folks are looking at us, and, uh, you know, by us I mean gun guys from the outside, they obviously we enjoy guns, we enjoy shooting them and all that kind of stuff, but we we don't really want to hurt anyone, right? It's it's we're just preparing. Exactly. Yeah, we're preparing for that moment yeah, when we get back into a corner. Exactly. Yeah, you know, and and we're very much aware of the destructive power of these guns, and it's not our first choice to do something. But you know, what do you do? Exactly. Sometimes life just you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, people are going to have to face that. We all hope it's never us, but sometimes life just brings you, you know, into that alley where your back is to the corner and you don't have any other choice, right? That's right. You, you don't really shoot to kill, you shoot to live. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's something that when people look at us from the outside, you know, they don't really realize that about us and... Um, you know, maybe people, there's a there's a whole bunch of other things. Like, I think a lot of uh, people looking at gun guys from the outside, or maybe because of politics or something like that, they think we don't care about the environment. Do you think that's true, that gun guys don't care about the environment? It's totally opposite of what it is. You know, the, the uh, wildlife, is, particularly in the state of Tennessee, I know about this, but I know what you're saying all over. You know, a hunter's fun wildlife restoration. You know, I remember when I was a kid, there were no wild turkeys around this part of Tennessee. There were very few deer. I mean, you would hunt for years before you saw a deer, but through the efforts of hunters and their funds, uh, buying uh, the excise taxes on guns and ammunition things, it's funded and, and brought back lots of game. We've even got a few elk in Tennessee now, but, but deer are just coming from there. Well, we can, we can kill four bucks a season where I live, but we can kill three does per day. So wow. many deer here. Wild, wild turkeys, I see them at least once a week out here in the yard. And the, uh, the uh, TWRA has done a real good job of restoring the wild turkeys and deer in Tennessee. And, and that's totally funded by hunters. Yeah, absolutely. And most of the times, there are gun guys, obviously, who live in urban situations, who live in the cities, but most of us live in the country. You know, and I think like the, the, the people who oppose us or say that we're against the environment or something like that, most of them live in concrete jungles. You know, it's kind of ironic. That's right. We live in this environment. You know, we have to take care of our own, taking care of our own place where we live. You know, we want to keep it clean. We want to keep the streams clean. Just like I have cattle, they're fixed where they can't get in the stream because, you know, they, they will, they'll, they'll uh, erode creek banks and stuff like that. And, and mess up streams, so we keep them back out of the streams and, and things like that. We want to take care of the environment and leave a better place for our kids than what we found. Right. So, um, you know, speaking of the environment, I want to take like a, a quick turn here. It's kind of relative to everything that's going on. Um, 
you know, what do you think about the situation that's happening right now in in Texas? I know you're you're a prepper, right? We could put you in safely put you in the category of being someone that preps. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, people knew this was coming. I mean, there's people stuck in their homes with people. You know, people are scalping, gouging prices on things like water and stuff that everybody should have had already. I mean, I don't care if you live in an apartment building, you can put three or four cases of water under your bed and keep it there. You don't need a big uh, storage facility to store this stuff, you know. Uh, people, uh, uh, a lot of people live from day to day. They do their grocery shopping one day at a time. I believe in the... And stock up on a lot of stuff, except you're going to need anyway. You know, you know times, times do get hard. You know, we had a flood here uh, four years ago. It kind of, it just, it devastated this area. A lot of homes and things. Uh, but, uh, you know, FEMA showed up about two weeks later. That's when we need any help. But then we already had everything taken care of. And the same in Texas. They got people in there volunteering. And neighbors helping neighbors. And, and that's what it needs. It's not the, it's not the federal government's job. The federal government has no right to take money from somebody to give to somebody else. People need to take care of themselves, take care of the neighbors, stock up, you know, keep stuff you're going to need anyway. You know, like spam. I, I keep a hundred or two cans of spam in the basement just because I like the stuff. Or if I live, I'll need it. If I don't, I won't need the two bucks it costs to buy it. Yeah. You know, so unfortunately in um, Texas, from what I saw in the news, I think we lost about eight people. Um you know the thing with the thing with hurricanes. Probably it's going to be more than that by the time I think it's been about thirty thousand plus people displaced, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, go ahead. What were we going to say, Jeff? Uh, well, people, you know, they warn people. I don't understand people staying. You know, when they say your home is going to be underwater, and they think they get they got gills like a fish and can endure the thing. You know, they need to get out of there. You know, the, the rest of it's just stuff. You know, people got to loosen down. They're stealing from their neighbors because their neighbors got displaced and run out from stores and, and different things. They just say the way some people treat people. But uh, uh, overall, I think, you know, you have a few looters and other ones makes the TV news, but uh, uh, it, it's about people helping people. And they'll get through this. It'll dry out and clean up and, and they'll be just, just good as new. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. And, you know, there's definitely people coming from lots of different states. I think when uh, back when Louisiana had their troubles, uh, Texas uh, and specifically Houston, that's uh, at this point the hardest hit, helped out a lot. Lots of people that left Louisiana went uh, wind up wound up in Houston. And now that it's kind of, you know, unfortunately, Houston's turn. You have a lot of people coming from there from all over the country, really to help out people there. I think, um, you know, I was looking at the news this morning. One of the problems in, in Houston specifically is that they overbuilt and there's uh, too much concrete right. on the ground. So there's no yeah, way for, no way for, to go. Yeah. There's no way for that water to go. And um, I'm not sure exactly what they're um, like, where they are, where they are compared to sea level, but I'm assuming that they're really low. And uh, I'm guessing going into all the, uh, buildup of infrastructure. They just didn't plan what to do when something like this happens, but it's happened before, right? So like you said, it's not it's not that you don't know something like this could happen. And then um, when hurricanes specifically move kind of slow, I think right now it's just, it's not, it's not a hurricane right now. I think it's a tropical storm, but it's just hanging out over that area. Yeah, it's sad that, you know, I mean, the people that could have, uh, they could have got out. If it wanted to, of course, and government officials could have could have told them, I think, to get out. But um, you know, people should, you know, adults should have enough sense to get out of that stuff. I mean, if you do stay and you make it through, you got no power, you got no water, you got no services, and you know, it's not going to be a pleasant place to be for for a couple of weeks at least. Yeah. So, as someone that thinks about this kind of stuff, um, you know, if you were preparing for something like this. What would you do? Well, I'd, I'd get to a high spot. You know, when I built my house, I built it up on a hill. You know, a lot higher than so. We had to flood here four years ago. It didn't affect me at all. I washed my bridge out, which was uh, just took a lot of money to put it back. But that's was one of those things. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, need to, you don't need to build in a low spot. You don't need to live in a low spot. You need to think these things through and, and, and plan ahead. Like I stock up water and stuff. I got my own well, but I also want some work. You'll keep some water that I can get to uh, when the electricity's not running at well pumps. 
Mm-hmm. You got paying for paying for the horse. Just like you have an insurance on your house or your car. You know, you're not planning to use it, but, but if you need it, you need it. Yeah, I yeah. think I think this one faked a lot of people out because it went very quickly from a tropical storm to a category one, and all of a yeah. sudden, boom. It's yeah. So category, yeah. Yeah, so Walter is saying that um, – because Jeff can't hear you, Walter. Okay. Yeah, uh, because we, we're using headphones here. But, yeah, uh, Walter is saying that this storm kind of faked out a lot of people and that they didn't think it was, you know, so maybe a few weeks ago or a week ago only, or so. That was only – that was before the weekend. I mean, last week it was cruising along at it, you know, and it was a, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And then all of a sudden, vroom, it – yeah. So it didn't it didn't look like it was going to be a category 4 when it was coming up, but I think the point that you're right. saying is that obvi- it's possible, right? They're in the Gulf. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. You know, if you're in the Gulf or you're you're close to the uh eastern seaboard, like lots of people are in Florida, you know, even where I live, I'm, I'm we're central Florida, so we're kind of like in the middle, but you there's still things that you anywhere you go to live in this country, there's something that could happen to you there, right? Well, yeah, you sure. can. Yeah. Tornadoes here. I'm a tornado. Well, I got a, a garage about 20 feet behind my back door of the house. The garage was destroyed. Tornado comes through. It didn't hurt the house at all. Tore down the garage. But, you know, things happen. And yeah. uh, even losing power, you know, in the storm. Well, you need you need the backups for power. Instead of, you know, like I said earlier, I love the grid, but you need to be a little bit independent of it where, where it's not, not a matter of life and death. Yeah, if you're if you're um, if you love the grid, prepare for the grid to fail in certain aspects. Now, hold on one second, Jeff. Uh, Walter wanted to say something. What was that you wanted to say, Walter? No, well, uh, what was it about? We were talking about. Um, oh, I have four generators, by the way. <laughs> um, I was mentioning about generators. Um, there was something else too, but I, I forget what it was now. Yeah, I think we were talking about like wherever you live, you can um, you you can get well, into yeah, the situation. I was going to ask you. You didn't live in Florida. Sure. You, yeah, you didn't live in Florida when Charlie came through Hurricane Charlie, and it went right up the middle of the state, right, probably right where you live. So yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, I think um, you know we were we were living in West Palm Beach. Uh, Walter was saying that I wasn't living in Florida when Hurricane Charlie came through, which I think is true. And then Hurricane Charlie just went like right up the middle of Florida and did a lot of damage, probably even in the area that I'm living now. And for sure, anywhere you live in Florida, you can have a hurricane. If you live on the if you if you live in the Gulf, you could have it anywhere along the uh, eastern seaboard, all the way up to New York City. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. N- New York City. I'm, I I can't remember exactly when, but New York City. Got, yeah, but they still got hit with something a few years ago, yeah. and there was a lot of yeah, flooding. Sandy, Hurricane Sandy. Yeah. So you know, wherever you live, things can go wrong. I mean, if you're if you're living out on the West Coast, uh, specifically in California, you've got earthquakes. You know, there's all these things that you have to deal with. Um, I mean, I'm sure even the folks that live in the like in the mountains in the middle of the country have things that that could potentially happen to them, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So you know, uh, just I I know that we probably have folks that usually would watch us from that area. You know, we are concerned. We do care about them. Okay. If they're gun guys, it's highly likely that they were prepared for things like this. One of the things that I saw, Jeff, when I was looking at the news, there were lots of people that had to leave their homes. And if you have to leave your home, you can't really carry a lot, can you? Especially when you've got water up to your waist or above that. <laughs> right. Also, you know, a lot of times, even us, we keep we make a point to keep our vehicles full of fuel all the time. Even an emergency at night, if we've got to, you know, get get uh, some family member to Nashville or something, uh, a hospital, you know, you need to keep your vehicles full of fuel. The only reason let your vehicle run low on fuel. If you're on the way to, to the car lot like to trade, other than that, you know, keep fueling the thing. So yeah. you don't end up paying eight dollars a gallon for it. Yeah, look at keeping your fuel tank full as kind of like a way of prepping. I know we all make this mistake. I, I get on Lola when she lets the tank get low. <laughs> you know, we we all do it from time to time. Yeah. Yes, I I am. I am. I, I'm okay. very nice to her. <laughs> I don't, you know, when I when I get mad, I don't get too mad because, you know, I don't want to wind up sleeping on the sofa. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun sleeping on the sofa. And it's also not fun having to, like, you know, feed yourself. Oh, 
Poor you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, um, let's see if we've got um, Mr. Sumgun says that there's tornadoes in the Midwest. That's true. I, I think there's lots of places you can get tornadoes, right? Oh, yeah. Sure. You can get a flood anywhere. Yeah, you can get yeah, we, floods. We, it, it's true where we live, but, but uh, we had a flood that, that came through, and it just, you know, they said it was like a once every 500 year deal, but we happened to be here for the 500 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, some places get um, tremendous amounts of snow. I see some folks talking about, so all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, we do think about those guys. I just wanted to make sure that we, we touched on that a little bit before we got into uh, other things. Walter, do you have any questions for, for Gunblast? Oh, 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 oh. now you, you, you got to ask me right now, don't you? Okay, um, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you some talk time. talk about guns and then they'll pop up, yeah. Okay, okay, so Walter wants to talk about guns, Jeff. Well, that's um, all right. You know, now one of the things I know you've been doing this so long that you know a lot of the companies, and I see you know lots of times when there's new guns coming out, you've already gotten those guns in advance, right? Yeah, a lot of companies are really good about giving me a, a heads up. You know, I mean, there's been guns for I've known about the gun three years before I can talk about it. Uh, there's some in production now that's it's been in, in for at least four years. I know of, but. But they're good about giving me a heads up on stuff, and I try to, if I can, have the gun here, get my review ready to post it the day they introduce the gun. And uh, that way, you know, if somebody's looking at, they see it's a blurb about the gun, they can go find out some details on it, see us shooting it, playing with it, and having a good time. Yeah, that's an awesome. It's an awesome thing. I know that there's so many of us are jealous of you, you know, being in that position where you get to see guns like years in advance but i know it's not easy um you, you probably have to sign um non-disclosure agreements and oh yeah yeah you've got lots of limitations so um i'm sure you can't talk to us about the things that are coming up but uh what are some cool guns that you've got um because you do articles on your dot com that's the that's the big focus for you guys right the dot com the blog sure yeah that's, that's where we make our money and that's where we really enjoy doing it but the YouTube stuff's kind of secondary to us. We get a little money off that. It's just, just a little gravy. We, we make our income off uh, off our gunblast.com and uh, we're truly well for us. And we've been doing that like a six, six, the year 2000. And uh, uh, we get to, we get to travel a lot and, uh, pretty much all the time if we want to take you know, different gun companies and things. But it's enjoyable. You know, when I was a kid, I would have, I would give anything to look inside a gun factory. And now I get to go to them and, and see things. In fact, one time, one the Savage wanted me to come up to their factory uh, and go through the factory and make my own rifle. And wow. I did that, and that was a lot of fun. You know, really interesting to see exactly how things are done. Wow, so you got to make your own uh, Savage uh, bolt action? Yep, with Savage bolt action, 22 to 50. Of course, they had a guy with me all the time. You know, he'd just have to make sure I didn't tear their equipment or kill myself or something <laughs> like that. But, uh, yeah. You know, I learned a lot of stuff of how the gun is actually made, you know, the project. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So the uh, the so the YouTube channel serves. Uh, obviously, you guys do videos on everything that you can release, but that's kind of like uh -huh. a, a, a teaser to get folks to come over to the uh, the the blog, right? Because the the articles, yeah, it, it, from what I see, are more. Um, it used to particularly be that way when we first started doing videos. We do like a little one or two minute video, and to get people to go read a full article. You don't get all the details, but now. People want all the info in the video. Nobody wants to read much anymore. Uh, particularly young people, they want to see it all on their cell phones. So we try to put as much information as possible just in video now. And some guys will want to do a video. Like if we've, if we've already reviewed a gun and they just come out with it in another caliber, another color, or something like that, we'll just do a short video on it to uh, kind of an update instead of rewriting the whole thing again and play on the same ground. Right, absolutely. So, what are some cool um, guns that you guys have articles, videos coming out on that you can tell us about? Oh, well, it's hard to say. You know, we've got so much. I love uh, Henry's always introducing new stuff. I got the new, the new lever action short shotgun coming out. The short version, we reviewed the long, the long version. Uh, Cimarron just introduced today a, uh, and that's a new forty-four Magnum uh, revolver. It's got adjustable sights and kind of a modern version, similar to a Ruger Circle Blackhawk, but, but it's uh, uh, built on the cold action you know, that, that you already built for Cimarron. So we got that uh, coming in pretty soon. And 
there's a couple of rifles on the way that I can't talk about yet. They're probably at my hardware store right now. I run everything through Brigham Hardware in Dover, Tennessee, and pick it up and do the, do the forms there. And uh, I got a couple there now that I got to go pick up. That, but it might be three or four weeks before I can talk about them. Oh, okay, cool. Have you ever thought about getting your own FFL? I used to have one years ago. I, I, I sold guns, kind of, a, uh, you know, sold them to friends and sold them to other people. You know, I just run the business out of my house. But the day Bill Clinton got elected the first time, I lost faith in humanity, packed it all up, sent it in. You know, but looking back, you know, he's not so bad now. But uh, at the time, <laughs> you know, I thought that I just gave up on humanity at that point. Yeah. And sent all my stuff in. Did but you? Now, it's, it's really easier for me to run a thing through the hardware store. Right. I don't. That way, when I go pick up a gun, even a test gun, I fill out a four four seven three on it, so there's no problems. And then that way, I you know, for send it back in, they just rear it in their books. But uh, usually, like we talked about earlier, I'm more than likely end up keeping it. So I already got the paperwork out of the way. Right. So um, I know you guys obviously have been in this a long time and you've seen a lot of stuff go on. What do you think about um, the current state of firearms? Uh, you know, when it comes to gun guys, um, you know, it's just in terms of politics, like, you know, with Trump being elected and um, also in terms of this whole YouTube thing, you know, that uh, obviously I know you guys aren't YouTube focused, but what do you think about that as well? Well, of course, on the Trump side, you know, it, it really hurt gun sales because people got comfortable again. They think nobody's out to, out to get your gun, but there's still a lot of people out there working hard to take our second win with rights away. And uh, it could happen, you know, I mean, as good as pro-gun as Trump is, you know, you got to think back. Ronald Reagan was pro-gun, but he signed the bill that uh, keeps us from getting any uh, new uh, full-auto weapons. And that's why the price of full-auto weapons have skyrocketed over the last few years. So they can't make any new ones for civilian sales. And Reagan did that to us, you know, as much as I liked him. He's the one that did it. So, we, you know, we gotta we got to keep an eye on Trump, uh, and keep pressure on him, make him know who his friends are, and make him know who put him in office. And uh, but there's also at the local and state levels, you got people uh, that uh, want to take away our gun rights, and so we got to keep watching. People have got comfortable, and you know now it, it made it. The, it's the best time ever to buy an AR-15. So they're dirt cheap. Uh, some people, you know, three or four years ago, paid two thousand dollars for a gun. You can buy now for four hundred. So it's a, it's a good time to buy guns. It's hard on the industry right now. Most of them have got warehouses full of guns and they're running rebates and things to clear them out. But, but it's real good for the consumer. Well, the YouTube thing, I really don't know what that's all about. I know our income off of YouTube dropped about a third all of a sudden. Uh, but like I said, we don't depend on that anyway. But uh, I really don't have any idea what that's all about. Yeah, I think what's happened lately with um, YouTube is that they've... Um they're trying to really marginalize, not just gun channels, I think a lot of um, people that they don't politically agree with, obviously, most of the folks running YouTube, Facebook, and all that kind of stuff are, are on the left, obviously, you know, and um, That's true. and then they see us as being on the right, although, we, you know, we really aren't. I think that gun guys go across the spectrum. A lot of us are really in the middle. We're kind of independent people. We don't necessarily consider ourselves Republicans or Democrats. But, you know, they, they put us in that category, so they've been uh, trying to marginalize, I think, lots of channels, not just gun channels. And one of the things that they're doing, like with our channel, is that automatically when videos go up, like this one, for example, um, when this goes up, it's automatically demonetized, and then we have to fight with them to get it back. Um, sometimes it can take an entire week before we get that video mon uh, monetized. And by that point, there's no advertising running on it anymore because the majority of the right. advertising comes when that video is new. Yeah, and, and, and then in some cases, what they're doing with us, there's certain videos that even when they look at it, they go, yeah, we'll never, this video will never be monetized. So um, what do you, obviously, you know, as we said before, that's not the, the, um, that's not the, the plan that you guys have been building up because you started a long time ago. Do you have any advice for the, and this sounds funny, me saying it, do you have any advice for the younger guys, you know, on what to do in, in a situation like this? Thing, Nick, is be, be honest, you know, tell the truth, if, you know, and don't, don't have an agenda, you know, don't, don't try, there's something like that, they just want to find something wrong with the gun, you know, 
if he's not a Glock, they want to hate him. You know, and that's not right. You got people, people loving these guns, people, uh, you know, a lot of families depending on these gun sales. But then again, the guy that buys the gun, he's got to have something that's reliable. So you need to report, you know, accurately on, on how that gun works. And, but what I always try to keep in mind, just because the gun is not my particular favorite, it might be perfect for somebody out there. It might be just what they need, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I can agree with you on that, that, um, you know, uh, listen, I think that there's lots of, there's different ways that different people go about uh, running their channels. The, the one thing about this is that people are free. Every, anyone out there can start a YouTube channel. Anyone can get into guns and start doing gun stuff. And then when that happens, people try to like stick to what their personalities are. Some of those people kind of go with, um, you know, kind of a, if it bleeds, it leads kind kind of a thing where, sure, uh-huh. you know, they 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 feel like they'll get more views if they're just really harsh or really destructive to things. And I'm not I'm not knocking that. That's true. They probably will. Yeah, yeah. I'm not knocking it. I get it. If if that's what works for people, and I think we all have our, our pos- positions that we fall into. I know for us, we're not trying to destroy the gun industry. You know, if you're if you're a gun guy, whether you're in the industry or you're on the other side of it where you're just buying guns, you know, whether you, if you're the consumer or even if you're where we are, where we're um, trying to bring information to people in our different ways. We're all gun guys. If we do things to destroy the industry altogether, you know, or destroy politicians that that could probably help us to maintain the rights that we have. It's kind of like being on an island where you're, you're surrounded by enemies. You know, ultimately, yeah. we'll all, you know, all of us, this thing that we care about will go away. Yeah, that's true. You and know, you, just gotta, you, know just, you gotta report on the gun in your hand. Like, a good example was when the Remington introduced an R-51 a few years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, the first guns they, they made from the first thousand guns, they worked great. We was at an event at gun site, a bunch of riders. We shot those guns for four days. They ran great. We got the guns home. They still ran great. Then when they transferred that over to CNC machinery, the first batch of guns that shipped didn't work. Oh, well, man, that was, that was hard on them. It was hard on us. You know, but I can't say a gun's not going to work if the one I'm holding works. You know. yeah. got report on the gun you got. And, uh, and thankfully, Remington, they made it right. You know, they, they offered people to trust their money back. Or they give them a new R1, or they can wait till they redo the R51. So, yeah. they took care of the customers, but the, uh, they got a lot of bad publicity on the boat, which, uh, yeah. you know, really they should have made to get I'm sure the guns are working good for the ship. Them. So, yeah. Own them too. Yeah, what well, were you. you, gotta, you gotta, I'm sorry. Everybody makes bad guns. I've got bad guns from just about every manufacturer out there. You know, get a gun that'll malfunction. It happens sometimes. Yeah. Uh, hold on one second, Jeff. What were you going to say, Walter? Yeah, you know, after they after they they put them out there, though, the damage is done. Um, especially especially a really big outfit like Remington, they should know better. So, I mean, you know, unfortunately, they only make it right. It's still in the in the eyes of a lot of people. It, it's kind of like it's like a Microsoft way of doing of uh, software. Just throw it out there. We'll fix it later. And that doesn't, that's not good. No. Yeah. What Walter is saying is that, you know, unfortunately um, for, a, for a big company like Remington, when they put the, when they put these guns out there to the regular consumers, you know, it, it was a, it was really a fiasco. So, I mean, and I think th- this is kind of like one of the places where, you know, even though it seems like we're trying to be negative towards the company, we we also have a responsibility to people who are actually buying these things, right? I don't know if you you, yeah. you believe that, right? You have a responsibility to them. When, oh, when yeah, yeah, like I, like I mentioned earlier, for gun mouth folks, we're going to report it every time. We're not going to sugarcoat anything, you know. But yeah. People need to know that, and a lot of people, you know, it's like I used to be when I was young. A guy can, he, you know, he, he's up to his neck in a mortgage and raising kids and all that stuff. He got the money to spend on a gun. Because he, he scraped and saved for it, the gun needs to work. You know, uh, you can. That's not too much to expect for any out of anybody to work like it's intended. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the thing. That's the thing that I try to remember. And I think um, lots of YouTubers out there, we that are doing this gun stuff, we're trying to think um, about that guy out there that has to buy this gun, 
costs anywhere from hundreds of dollars up to thousands of dollars. He has to go through a background check. You know, for, for the mo he cannot, for the most part, shoot that gun himself before he buys it. You know, and then when he buys this gun, if there's a problem with it, it's it automatically devalues, and it's not that easy to go out there and sell it again, right? Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And you know what? You know, if I've got, a, I don't want to sell a gun to somebody if I know the gun don't work. You know, right. that's something you don't want to do too. Anybody in the ethics not going to do that. And so you've got a gun you can't sell, and, and you spend all your gun money on something that don't work. Yeah, you don't want to sell anything that doesn't work to anyone, you know, not a car, nothing like that, unless you tell that person explicitly, this thing does not work, no. you know, yeah. and, then, and then they still choose to do that. Obviously, some people don't do that. And here's the thing, you know, I know that when the whole Remington thing happened, um, you kind of got some heat over that, right? Oh, yeah. I got a lot of hate mail over that one. You know, I could tell people, you know, the guns that I had, well, I've still got one of the first generation guns. One of the first thousand, it still worked perfectly. Yeah. The second generation gun works good too. You know, they they work. You know, but they did ship a bunch of bad guns, and, and they're they're having to pay for it. Yeah. One of the things that I saw, and and you're probably not aware of this, but this is something that um. The, from my, this is from my point of view. Obviously, this is you know we all have different point of views in how we do this thing. You know, I remember seeing the R51 at Shot Show. And I actually did a video on it, and I was talking to an engineer, and it, it was cool. But after the, you know, the video, after I did it, Lola, Lola was saying, like, you know, you don't, usually you're excited about a gun, but you didn't really seem that excited. And I told her, yeah, there's something about it that, to me, just didn't really capture my attention. But I didn't think anything good or bad. I just thought, well, this didn't really capture me all the way, right? Uh -huh. But when the gun started... Another example, you know, example, mm -hmm. sometimes... Gun, gun reviewers like, like me and you and other people, you know, we, we want ourselves to become gun snobs if we're not careful. You know, like, mm -hmm. I hadn't, hadn't shot a high point in, in 15 years, you know. Mm -hmm. But to some guy out there, that's all he can afford. And the yeah. guns do work, you know. So, so, uh, so a lot of times we spend our time on shooting $3,000 guns, which uh, is a very low uh, market for those. Uh, because a lot of people going to buy a $150 gun if they can, and it needs to work too. Yeah. You just expect that gun to work just as well as the high power gun. Yeah, absolutely. And if that's what they can afford, and, uh, you know, I don't, I definitely don't want to discourage people from things. I, I try as much as I possibly can to give them the real deal. Now, the thing I was going to tell you about the R51, when it started coming out in gun stores, there were several gun stores that I went to that were sh that, that were talking about the uh, the manufacturing quality of the guns, and that you know the o the gun store owners were seeing that these guns would malfunction just from handling them. You know, mm -hmm. I heard the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So now, by the time we got around to the NRA show, where you know all the like people were putting out videos and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the funny things that I saw that happen, and this is from my from my personal point of view for anyone out there that's listening, you know, I was at the Remington booth at NRA, and I, I saw the guys that work there. There were people because you know NRA is where the 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 public gets to come and talk to these guys, <laughs> and there were people coming up to the the uh, Remington booth and asking them about the problems with the gun and the guys in the booth were telling them that they deliberately designed the guns this way for their own safety. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was terrible. You know, that was that was like the craziest thing or one of the craziest things. I've seen some other stuff like that, but it's one of the craziest things I've seen since I've been in the gun world because literally a few days after the NRA show, they recalled these guns that they were telling people they designed it that way. And I think, you know, I don't I'm not saying that was everyone at Remington doing that. Obviously, we all have opinions about Remington because it's a big you know, it's now part of the Freedom Group. It's a big conglomeration. You know, we tend to dislike things like that. But I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that they made and lots of companies make, including in the gun world, where when they make mistakes, they just don't face up to it directly. You know, a lot of the gun companies, you know, they have a, uh, they'll get a new CEO and he'll come in there and he'll bring his buddies with him and, and they'll do what they can for a couple of years and they move on. You know, they're, they're not gun guys. They don't care. And, and one thing you know is the difference. Now, Mike Pfeiffer just retired from Herbert. 
mm-hmm. was there for about nine years as CEO, I think. But Mike, and the different, one reason River is real successful, you know, they, they only had three CEOs through Mike Piper there since 1949. But Mike was a, he went to all the shows, he would work all the shows, like in on that show, he would talk to people. He didn't have on the bag saying, I'm King of Ruger or nothing like that. He was out there on the floor talking to people. At the end, Toronto, Henry's the same way. Yes. A lot of these CEOs, they don't hate the public, they don't care. You know, they just be as happy making tennis rackets as they are doing. Well, you get a CEO like, uh, like Mike Pfeiffer doing a job like that, you know, and at the end, Toronto, Henry. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Um, I know Anthony Imperato from Henry Rifle. Henry Rifle to me is like uh, a, a perfect example. If other, if someone's starting a company right now in the gun world and they want to look at, you know, they want to look for examples out there of how to do what you do. I think Henry's a great example. Um, not just that they, they make a great product, they, they have a lot of pride, they put a lot of craftsmanship, they, they go back into, you know, like uh, quality controls, all of that, absolutely. But they actually believe in the Second Amendment, <laughs> yeah. you know, they put their money where their mouth is, you know, and I've seen Anthony Imperato, for example, at shows standing there talking to people until the, like, you know, until there's no one to talk to. Yeah, but a lot of these CEOs are like they shot shows up. They they might be back at home office where they might be up in the booth just talking to people with a lot of money buying a lot of guns. But Anthony and Mike and guys like that are out on the floor talking to the final consumer. One thing about Anthony, I don't know if he's going to be telling us or not, but you know, uh, three or four years ago when they came out with the, uh, the 1860, the original Henry, mm-hmm. redoing it, you know, that, that was originally made years ago. Back in 1860, the barrel and the magazine tube were one piece of steel. And uh, Anthony's engineers came to him and said, you know, we can do this in two pieces and weld that together and nobody will ever know the difference. Mm-hmm. And Anthony said, I don't know. We're going to do it right. And, uh, and that's his attitude on, on, on building those guys. He wants, them, he wants to build them where people can afford it, but he also wants to build them right. And making it right comes first. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think we need... Um you know, I think we need to encourage guys that are like that, and we need to encourage more companies to be that way. You know, this is like, this is a, a complete effort with all of us. I think, you know, what you said earlier is true. These are mechanical things. Anyone that makes a, a, a mechanical thing knows that something can go wrong with it. I don't, honestly, if you make anything, something could go wrong with it, right? You know, even if you write software, <laughs> yeah. you make babies. <laughs> They're made in uh, North Carolina factories over to Ruger Factory over there. Mm-hmm. And they have a, the way the lines are set up during sales. Like the raw material comes in, it makes a big horseshoe shape, and it comes back in their boxes from the other. Anybody mm-hmm. on that line knows how to do every job on that line. Mm-hmm. And anybody on that line can stop that line at any time if they see a problem. And the engineer is not in the office back in South Fork or in the New Hampshire. Uh, he's on the line, his desk is right beside the assembly line. So for the problem, the engineer's sitting right there and can correct you. And it's just, uh, uh, that effort, the way they do things like that, it's, uh, it's, it makes things, it makes it better. You know, they're not making, like the way the old manufacturer was, they would, you know, a machinist would make the same part all day long, and he got boxes of parts sitting everywhere. And, uh, but if a part was wrong, they said to scrap it. Now, when they make a part of it, yeah, yeah. I think we should definitely encourage that. Uh, I'm going to read one of the comments from uh, someone in the chat. 803 Salad Shooter, he said, gun company executives are not gun guys anymore. They're businessmen. That's great for the company, but bad for the consumer and the products. Well, that's true. Now, like Mike Pfeiffer, when he came to Rupert, you've seen the example because I know him well. Mm-hmm. His, his career, he was a navigator on a submarine. He wasn't a gun guy. But he became a gun guy when he got there. He started hunting. He never hunted before. He started hunting and shooting a lot. And, and one thing Mike's done ever since he started, every weekend, uh, I'm sorry, not every weekend, one weekend a month, he'll go to a gun store somewhere in the country that's having a special day, like a grand opening or anniversary sale or something. And he'll work in that gun store on the sales counter all weekend. 
Mm-hmm. And like I said, you don't have a sign that uh, Mike Piper murder. He just started meeting people, selling them guns. Everybody's guns. Like just selling them murders. But he made a determination that he was going to learn the guns and, and not just the big part of guns. And uh, the executives that Colonel Mike came on, uh, like I said, he was, uh, he was used to making quick decisions and navigating on, on a nuclear submarine. And they, they told me, they said, we'll go to Mike and he'll give us a decision right now. It might not be the decision we want, but he don't tell us to come back tomorrow. He'll make the decision. And, uh, and that's good for the company. And Mark is really, uh, he's done a good job and he's learned guns. He loves guns. And that makes a difference. Uh, yeah. You know, I th- were saying, a lot, a lot of these guys are just not gun guys. They don't understand. Yeah, I think we need more people like that. And I don't think you have to be born a gun guy or, or been a gun guy since you were a teenager like you were. I think, like you said, if someone, you know, if you're a good person and you go into a business and, and you take this on as, as the business that you're doing, if you're a good person, you take ownership and responsibility of that. If you don't believe in guns, you don't sell guns. But if you do believe in them. And, mm-hmm. I love coke. Here's another good example. I love coke. Well, it's a good old company been around for decades, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I learned about two months ago the coal, they just, you know, they started making the coal again, that double action revolver. Right. I learned that coal had uh, renewed the copyright on the name Trooper. So I called the factory, talked to a lady I know there, and she said, yeah, we're going to bring back the Trooper. We, me and you both know that was a three fifty seven Magnum revolver. Mm-hmm. But they're using that name on an AR-15. You know, they, they don't, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like they don't understand. They're not gun people. Not anymore. Yeah, not anymore. They might have been at, at, at one point. And, and this is the thing, you know, there's lots of companies out there that manufacture guns. Um, some of them are in places where the, the states, for example, that they live in have lots of anti-gun laws. But if, you, if you're, and so obviously, you know, they're manufacturing things that the regular people that work there may not be able to buy. But if you own a, a gun manufacturer, if you have that manufacturing FFL, you and the people that work for you have the responsibility to go out there and shoot these things that you make. You should really be yeah. into it. If you're not into it, I don't think you should do it because it shows it when it when these things show up in the stores and people put their hands on it and they try to use it for whatever reason that they want to, they can see it, they can tell. Um, I just wanted to read a comment from, um, I think this is saving the day. He says it's been two weeks since he did the online return for the SIG P320 that he has, and he still hasn't had any response yet from SIG. Do you have any uh, comment about the P320? Did you guys get a chance to test it? Uh, yeah, we, we reviewed that, I guess, uh, a few months ago. And only had more time because we didn't hammer test it. You know, I think that's the problem where if you drop it real hard, it'll, there's a problem with it. I don't know anything about that. I, I hear that SIG's recalling wrong, but, you know, I was thinking for... You know, for the and the U.S. military has adopted that system. Mm-hmm. So uh, for the for the U.S. military, it's not going to be a problem. For the French, they might drop their guns and raise their hands, but I don't think none of our boys will be dropping their guns anyway. Yeah. So, um, so what you're saying is basically, um, you know, like. Your, your opinion of the, the P320 is that it's not too bad, right? Obviously, you guys didn't drop test it no, and all I mean, that. It worked fine. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a good work. You know, all those guns like that, the, the Ruger American, the 320, the HK, the Glock, all of them, you know, to me, they're tools that work great. And mm-hmm. I'm sitting on center and rub on, you know, plastic frame guns and all of them. We've had plastic frame guns around since the HK BP-70 years ago. But, uh, but you know, the darn things work, it's about all you can say about them. I mean, if they think there might be a problem with it, they're recalling it. I guess that's a good thing. Like, we're going to just recall their Mark IVs, you know, the first time. Right. The they put after there's, there's a potential that you can fire if you pull the trigger and release the safety. So they'd, they'd rather be safe than sorry, I guess. Yeah. So with SIG, um, what do you think about their response to the whole thing? I think for the most part, SIG kind of owned up to it, right? Maybe it took them a couple of days. Or something like yeah, that. From what, I've heard, from what I've heard, they have it. It sounds like, you know, probably, uh, you know, if he, if he sent in his information about getting a recall, probably what they're doing, they don't want, you know, 10,000 guns coming in the same week, but mm-hmm. they can't get them back to God. I like, uh, as an example, we're going to do my Mark IV. You know, I waited a couple of weeks and they sent me the mailer to send it back in. Okay. So they want a guy's gun to get there and get it fixed 
get down instead of everybody sitting there at the same page. You know? oh, okay, so, so that's probably what they're doing. They probably got a, a list of people and they just let him know when's the proper time to send his gun in. Okay, so you're saying like right now, if he hasn't heard anything from them, it's not unusual. There's probably a reason. So at this point, he shouldn't like be too worried about it, right? Sure, I wouldn't worry about it if it's me. Okay. Um, you know, at what point do you think um, it becomes like if we don't hear from them that it becomes a bad thing? Well, I would, I would give them maybe three, maybe four weeks, and if you don't hear, I double check, make sure that they did get his information. You know, a lot of times. Emails just don't go where you think they're going. And I don't know whether he called or emailed or whatever, but you know, stay on them. If, if you don't hear anything in another week or two, it wouldn't hurt to give them another call and get yeah. the information straight from the city. Yeah. I I um I, I think that's good advice. I think that at this point SIG realizes that we're all looking at them. You know, and so if they don't do something about this, then we're all going to start talking about it again. Maybe that news has quieted down a little bit, but if they don't address this, um, you know, we're we're definitely going to bring it back up, and it'll be a thing. So they're they're probably working on it. I know that. Um, uh, what is this comment here? Uh, Rebel Sapper says uh, we need reports and changes to the trigger if any of these P three twenties come back. So, you know, I know people have that desire to get the information, and I think you probably will get the information about what they change on it. Because it looks like they realized there was a problem when they were developing these for the Army. It looks like, I mean, the Army test thing pretty hard, you know. It looks like they would have, if anything, uh, well, it's going to be a problem they come up with it. But I'm yeah. sure they'll take care of it. They, you know, like any company, they don't want a bad product out there that could potentially hurt somebody. Right. It could cost them their company. Right, absolutely. Okay, so um, I'm going to go on to a couple of other things here. I just want to remind everyone, we have lots of people looking, lots of people making comments. I just want to remind you guys to click the like button, click that thumbs up. Okay, we really need that. Also, uh, share this, share this video that we're doing this on social media with your friends. That helps us get the message out there. Um, and don't forget to subscribe. Okay, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. All right, so now... Um, uh, so, what do you think about the NRA, Jeff? How long have you been going to the NRA shows? I've been going to the NRA show, I guess, I guess as long as we've been going to the shop show. We went to the same year, started in 2000. Well, the NRA show was media and the, been going ever since. I love the NRA, I love the NRA show rather than shot. You know, it's, it's a lot more laid back. You got uh, anybody, like you said earlier, anybody that's an NRA member can go to the NRA show. And if you're not a member, the sign yet to the door. Right. Uh, it, uh, it just puts a, a people can get get in there and talk to people that actually make the guns and look at the new stuff coming out. And, uh, you know, the NRA is an organization. They're not perfect. They're far from perfect. But they're the best thing we've got right now as far as uh, fighting for a right just because of sheer numbers. You know, uh, uh, politicians don't want to go up against the NRA unless they're just stupid politicians. You know, like Hillary Clinton, she come out and said it was Public enemy number one was the NRA. Well, there was, there's at least four million people and their families she alienated right there. Yeah. Uh, I'm a member, I'm a benefactor member. I'm at the top level that you can do, uh, which just means I gave a lot of money. But I believe in them enough that uh, I thought it was important to give them that money. Right. Yeah, you know, um, I think if you look at this, if you analyze this, um, for Trump to become president, he didn't have a lot of help from the Republican Party itself, I don't think. You know, no, he didn't. no, I think he had a lot of help from the NRA. They were early in there, you know, to support him. Um, I mean, even to my surprise, like I was kind of surprised that the NRA just very quickly got behind Trump, you know. Um, I don't know how they made yeah. that decision. There wasn't, I didn't see a mailer or anything like that go out there. What choice did they have? Yeah, uh, Walter says they didn't really have any choice. It's a different thing. We've never seen a politician like him before. Uh, mainly because before that, he wasn't a politician. You know, right. He was a, a real estate investor and a showman and TV show and that kind of thing. Something kind of different. But the only guy close to like him was Reagan. You know, he was the same thing. The established Republican uh, at the time, they didn't like him, but the people liked him. And that made all the difference. Yeah, every now and then there's changes that come along, you know, um, in the, if you look at the, how people become presidents, there's these, uh, 
um, I don't know how to put it, maybe anomalies or, you know, seismic events that happen. You know, most of the time you have people that become president and it's just a normal political process. I think with sure, Obama, yeah. yeah, I think with Obama, he became president and it was kind of like, you know, the first new media president where when he was running, he was in video games. The media was all the way behind him. You know, everyone in Hollywood loved him. So he just had this huge media push behind him becoming president. I don't see yeah. that as being exactly the same thing that happened with Trump. Um, you know, Obama kind of came out of nowhere. A lot of us have known Trump. I've known him as long as I've been living in America. I grew up in New York. I've run into him several times, his family and all that kind of stuff, just growing up in New York. So we've, we've known him, heard about him, and obviously he's uh, been on TV and all kinds of stuff. But what he did was, I mean, it was real, to me, I feel like it was real guerrilla warfare, you know? Because he didn't have the Republican Party on his side, he didn't have the media on his side, he didn't have uh, people in Hollywood and entertainers and all that who did love him in the past. But well, when he when, he, when he became a Republican, it became a totally, because he used to, be, he was, Trump for most of his life was a Democrat. Yeah, everybody loves the guy in the party. Uh, what was that, Walter? I said everybody loves the guy that's throwing the big party. Yeah, Walter said everyone loves the guy that's throwing the big party. But the thing is that once Trump decided he was running and uh, he was running as a Republican, and then at first he was like a joke, you know, and and all the regular Republicans in the party were like, yeah, we'll, we'll just knock this guy out in a couple of weeks. Even but, Obama threw it, just, just yeah. uh, dished him. Yeah. And Trump appealed to the people, you know, the ones that actually – Walked in the booth and took the lever to vote for him. And, uh, you know, he wasn't my first choice. Uh, I voted for Dr. Carson in the primaries, you know, because everything that Dr. Carson said, I agreed with. Mm -hmm. He was, to me, the, the smartest guy out there. Uh, he's obviously a, a, a very intelligent man, you know, successful doctor he is, but, but his politics agreed with mine. I didn't agree with everything Trump said, but, you know, when it come down to uh, Trump or Clinton, there was, was no choice for me. And I voted no. for Trump, and, uh, you know, I gave money to a billionaire. You know, how stupid is that sound? <laughs> I sent money to him for his campaign. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, the thing is, is that, um, like, here's the thing I think about Ben Carson. He is, he's too nice. He's not exciting enough. Yeah. yeah, Walter says he's not exciting enough. I think he's an incredibly intelligent guy. I think we're living in this crazy world now where being intelligent and being nice, being a gentleman, being soft-spoken, all the things that most of us really, in real life, we respect that, you know, to the masses, it just doesn't move them. But a, a lot of those... They don't have the charisma. They're looking for a showman. And with Trump, they got a showman. I mean, he put on a good show and all, but, uh, and, you know, hopefully, you know, so far I'm satisfied with him. Yeah. Like I said, he wasn't my first choice, but, uh, you know, he's our president. Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say, Walter? People are tired of the nice guy that apologizes all the time. Yeah, uh, Walter says that that he also believes that people are tired of a nice guy that apologizes apologizes all the time, and a lot of Americans yeah. just wanted like America to stand up and be tough. Yeah, girl is saying. Yeah, yeah, and maybe for the rest of the world to have like a little bit of fear, you know. So there were a lot of things said about Reagan back in the days. I came to America during uh, Reagan times, and I visited America and all that uh, before that. And, you know, as someone living outside of America and then coming to live inside of America, one thing I could tell you about Reagan is that people in other countries were scared. You know, they were they were afraid of that cowboy, that guy who might go, you know what, we're, we're going to get you. That's true. You know, you like when the, uh, if it weren't for Cargan, uh, Carter, we would have had Reagan. Like, Carter was, he was more of an apologist, you know, and, uh, and, uh, uh, of course, they blubbed up the thing, you know, over in Iraq or in Iran with that helicopter crash and all that stuff, which that wasn't really his fault. I mean, they, they tried, but uh, nobody was nobody was afraid that Carter would do anything. Uh, yeah. They was afraid that when Reagan got in there. Reagan, t Reagan told the Iranians, you got 15 oh, yeah. minutes after I'm inaugurated. Yeah, Walter says Reagan told the Iranians that you have 15 minutes after I'm inaugurated to do something. And they did. And they did. Yeah, I think that's what we need, you know. Um, uh, 
you know, unfortunately, we're not living in a world where you could just walk softly and then carry a big stick. You got it. You kind of like, OK, you got the big stick, but you you kind of have to have the bravado as well to make the world think, oh, this guy could do it. If they see that America is not going to do anything and they could just keep playing games and getting money from America and pushing, you know, pushing everything down the line. And then by the time we figure it out, they've gotten away with things. We're not going to get any results and the world's not going to be a better place for that. Obama. It's true. A lot of people in the world, you know, they, they just, um, they need to be dealt with. Of course, you know, the, we're 18% of the population, but sometimes we tend to tell the whole world how to live. You know, and, uh, and that's not right either. So there's a balance in there somewhere. We've got to, we got to mind our own business, but also stick up for, for what's right. Yeah, so how, do, so how does that happen? Because it seems to me like, um, you know, whether we like it or not, we're kind of like the, uh, we're the police to the world. Whether it's our fault or the world's fault, sometimes it seems like the world comes to us and they want us to save them. Sometimes it seems like we go to the world and try to save people. You know, it's a funny situation to be in, but we're there, aren't we? Yes, yeah, so yeah, like, what, what do you do? I mean, if you can, if you have the potential, like my neighbor, you know, if, if he falls down and gets hurt or somebody's beating on him and, and I don't do anything, I don't have to do anything. But if I have the ability to help him, if I don't, you know, what's that make me? I'm no, really no better than the guy that's beating on him. So there's a balance there somewhere. I don't have all the answers. Hopefully somebody smarter than me does. Yeah, absolutely. And if there's a bully in the neighborhood that's beating up people, it might not be you that he's beating up right now. But what makes you think when he's done with that guy, he won't come after you? Or yeah, someone that yeah, you do care yeah, about. You see places in the world, you know, where people are, uh, the government are mean, you know, they, they, they muster gas their own people. You know, things like that, you can't just let it happen and yeah. not say anything, you know. Yeah. It seems like uh, a lot of the world, and I'm here, you, know, you don't look exactly like me, but I, I use this example a lot of time, you know, just because it's not a bunch of, you know, Irish white kids get to be home. You know, mm -hmm. you got to help the brown people and the yellow people, all the people in the world. They're all people, you know. We've got to help where we can help it. If we can't help and we don't help, you know, we're no better than they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, I agree with you on that. And I also agree with you that on the flip side of that, you know, people in the world have to be able to stand up for themselves and fight for themselves. Exactly. The problem is, is that we are probably, if not the last place, we're, we're close to being the last place in the world that you can actually, that the regular person can actually have the ability to defend themselves, to arm themselves. There's not... You know, obviously there's places around the world that people can have guns and all that kind of stuff, but I can't think of anywhere else in the world that's like America. And the reason why I bring that up is how the hell do, do people change things when, you know, they're in governments that the government has the guns and the government has the tanks and the government has the helicopters, attack helicopters and all that. Even even for us in America, even though we can have, the, like I, I have this, people ask me this all the time um, as a gun guy. They're like, what kind of guns, you know, where do you draw the line? Do you need a tank? Do you need an attack helicopter? You know, and I tell them, listen, if I could get a nuclear missile, <laughs> I would buy it. I don't yeah. I don't know why, but I just love those things. Oh, yeah, the A-10s. <laughs> yeah, those are beautiful. <laughs> you know, so the thing, because, you know, even for us here in America, we could one day be facing our government. And no matter how many guns right. we think we have, we we probably don't have enough if we wind up facing our government. Well, then imagine other countries. They're even worse. Mm, I think you'd be... That's, that's why we have the Second Amendment, you know. A lot of people think it's about deer hunting, and it has nothing to do with deer hunting. You know, the people that wrote the Second Amendment, they just come through a situation where they had to overthrow their government. The people had to overthrow their government, and they wanted to keep, keep that uh, right where they could do that again if they had to. It won't ever be easy, you know. I'm, I'm sure we wouldn't win, but uh, uh, but then again, we might, you know. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. It's okay, a crazy so world. yeah. Now, hold on one second, Walter. Walter wants to get a word in here. What were you going to say, Walter? Oh, oh, about the not having enough guns to take the government over. Yeah. I think you, you might. I think you might be surprised. <laughs> okay, Walter says uh, <laughs> that we might be surprised. Some of us do have the guns. Walter, you never talk about that here. Nope, nope. You know, we don't no, let, no, we what, don't I'm, let what, I, what I'm saying is uh -huh. 
just because I don't think everybody in the government would fight for the government. Let's say that. Yeah. Well, so what Walter is saying, he doesn't think everyone in the government would fight for the government if that if it came down to that. I kind of agree with that. You I know, think that there's good guys out there, right? I guess, I guess like in, in our civil war, we had you know, a long time ago. It was a bad situation, but you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the generals they, they succeeded with the South. You know, they stuck to their state, and uh, and uh, you know they fight for what they believed in at the time. And uh, you know, I think I think it would happen now too. You know, you're not going to have everybody that, that wants to uh, fight for Nancy Pelosi. You know, or right. what she she. Right. So now that we're on the subject of, uh, you know, insurrection, yeah, of insurrection and uh, civil war and stuff like that, what do you think about what's going on lately with, um, you know, in regards to all of that, where we're trying to um, destroy everything that represents whatever it is that happened in the past? What do you think about that whole situation? Obviously, you're a southerner, so. It's a bad situation. And people don't understand. They're, they're acting off of stupidity and emotion. You know, um, uh, the things, you know, if they want to, I mean, they, they're one of the tear-down statues of Confederate generals. So, you know, those guys were fighting for their homes. Uh, you know, for uh, there's lots of reasons they had that war. Uh, they try to make it now that it was all about slavery, but, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation that, that Lincoln signed did not apply to the Northern slave states. Slavery is bad. You know, no man should be able to control another man. But when he uh, when they uh, he signed that Emancipation Proclamation, they exempted Maryland and Delaware, the two northern states that did not succeed. They got to keep uh, slaves, and it wasn't until 1863, well into the war, that uh, Lincoln came out against slavery. It was a political stunt, just like we have politicians now doing things, and uh, you know, uh, slavery should have never happened. But it's still going on all over the world today. And I wish those people would put those efforts into the slavery that's happening now in, in African parts of Asian places where people are, uh, their daily life is uh, waking up as a slave every day. Yeah, and I think even here in America, there's people that are slaves. You know, um, exactly. Yeah, you know, and I'm not just talking about mental slavery or slavery to the government or financial slavery. There are people here in America that are actual slaves. I think we all agree slavery is a bad thing, right? It is, and you know, a lot of the you know, we talk about Mexicans coming over the border. Many of those people, I know, they pay a coyote, you know, a guy to bring them over, and they're indebted to work off what they pay that coyote. They're employed here in Florida. Uh, where it's a Mexican restaurant or whatever it is, pay that coyote $10,000, whatever, and they've got to work that off. They're indentured servants, I guess is the nice way to put it, but it's a slave. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm going to assume because of the way that you look, right? You know, it's not a bad thing to me. I like, I, I don't think we should all look the same, you know, and. and yeah, really? How, how fun would that be? Absolutely. It would not be fun. I don't want to live in that world where we're all the same, where everyone looks the same, where all the things are the same. So, but because of the way that you look, um, has it happened to you that you've been accused of being racist or, you know, like you, you look absolutely. like a biker and all that kind of stuff? Has that happened to you? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you got a couple of minutes? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, this, this, this story might take a few minutes to tell you, but in Israel, what you just said, we had a, a, somebody called me one day, you know, talking about the reality stuff. Well, let's give them the show Pawn Stars. Nice show, I used to love it. Pawn and Stars, said, well, okay. Be, there'll be a gun expert on Pawn Stars. Okay. I said, you already got gun experts. They said, well, we want you to do it. So, anyway, I agree. They said, what we want you to do is come out here and uh, sell a gun in the pawn shop to introduce you to Rick and stuff. I said, well, no gun experts going to sell a gun in the pawn shop. You're going to get 40% of what it's worth. So a few minutes, the lady calls back. She says, okay, we want you to come out here and I'll buy a gun. I said, I would do that. Of course, she said, the problem is you, uh, we can't sell guns. We don't have FFL. Can you bring your gun that we can use on the show to sell? I said, sure, I can bring your gun. So mm -hmm. They said it had to be pre-1898 to be an antique. So I did that when I turned over to Chester. We'll go in and we'll meet the guy, uh, the producer guy. He had a sign of paper saying I can use this, this gun on the, on TV. I said, great, that's fine. 
Well, he goes back a few minutes, another producer comes in, a male producer. He happens to be a black guy. He says, I hear you got a problem with colored people. You know, what? what? <laughs> so, yeah, he says, I okay. hear you got a problem with colored people. I said, I don't know where you got that idea. So, so, so one of the producers. I've never even used the term "covered people." So let me just get this straight. So that one of the producers yeah. just came in, and out of nowhere, he was a black guy, and out of nowhere, he said to you that you have a problem with colored people. Yeah, and that's the term he used. I said, I said no. I said I've never said anything like it. He's white guy. He said eight of my people and my crew are, are colored people, and uh, uh, that's not going to work. I said, sir, never said anything like that, but. Anyway, then this director chick comes in. She says, "Well, the deal's off. We can't shoot. Uh, we can't get a gun range." I said, "I know that's a lie. I've shot all over Clark County, Nevada. I know you can shoot anywhere." Uh-huh. So anyway, but I went back to the hotel. And, uh, a producer from New York then called me, and she said, "And I knew her. I've known her for a couple months." She said, "Jeff, I know you didn't say what they said you said." I yeah. said, "I said no, Jill. I've never even used the term color people in my life. I've used a lot worse." But I've never used that, you know. But, but anyway, they assumed that the first producer did. They said we was from Tennessee and we was just, it looked like Hicks, that we was just practice, you know. And, uh, and that was shocking to me. And, you know, this being in 2016, it's something like that would happen. But, but it did happen. And, uh, Wait, that happened in 2016? 2016, yes, sir. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I've known you since before that. And, um, You've never ever been like that. I think I met you the first time we went to um, to Shot Show, and I met you guys uh, on Media Day on the range, Lola and I. And you guys have always uh-huh. always treated us. You know, I, I'm I'm like uh, that's that's never been you. You know, yeah, I don't know where those it, guys are coming with that, that from. This is 21st century. What, what difference the color of some guy's skin like? That don't have anything to do with anything. But they assumed, except when we were from Tennessee, you know, we just had to be some hill that, that hated anybody that wasn't white, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's unfortunate, man. I'm, I'm you know, sorry to hear that that happened to you. Um, and obviously those people don't know you. I, I I know you, your brothers. I've known you guys for a while. You guys have never been like that. You've always taken time and, like, you know, stood there in the sun when you should be making videos, talking to us and all that kind of stuff. It's unfortunate that this stuff happens, and I think it happens on both sides, that people just assume yeah. things, you know? Yeah, like the term, here's a term that, that I don't like, reverse racism. It's not reverse racism, it's racism either way, you know? Yeah. If, if you're, you know, a, a Mexican hating a Chinaman, it's racism, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, I think that's one of the problems that we have, that people believe that, for example, if I'm black, I'm not capable of being racist, and that's crazy, <laughs> you know. It sure it is, and you, and you might have good reason to, you know, you might have, uh, all the white kids might have threw rocks at you when you were a kid or something, and you grew up thinking everybody was like that, you know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's a little basis behind anybody's prejudices, uh, whatever it is, like, I'm prejudiced against rattlesnakes, but I think they're going to bite me. Right. Even before I get to know that thing, I yeah. think he's going to bite me. So, uh, but it can work either way, but it's sad that it does. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And I think, you know, I often tell people this, you know, if, and, and I have this conversation sometimes with, uh, with just, in, you know, with just black people, that when we're, when we're worried, if we hear something that someone said and they, they said something that was, terrible and it makes that person sound, you know, really racist or whatever. I think, hey, it's possible that that person is a a racist or someone who, you know, judges people based on their color and all. That's absolutely possible. But here's the thing. What happens if someone records what we say? Because even for us, if people recorded what we say and the things that we do and the things that we, for example, say about white people, it's not going to look, it's not going to look or sound nice. You know, but what happens is that we, one, people don't put those things out there. And for the most part, we get away with it. And none of us should be doing it. I mean, I think that's, you know, I think that's what Martin Luther King and lots of people that that fought for equal rights, that's what they were fighting for. They weren't fighting so that we could be separated or segregated because of who we are. Now, back then, maybe people were segregated and it was a bad thing. They weren't fighting so that we could be segregated and it would be a good thing because you're black 
or you're this thing or you're that thing, you're going to be above other people. They were fighting for us all to be equal. Yeah, that's true. And you know, we're all souls. You know, and we're souls in the body. You know, we're not we're not a body with a soul. And when you look at it that way, you know, we're all souls. I mean, God made people different colors, but if he put them on little red-headed Irish people in Africa, they just sunburned and died, you know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, he put people where they needed to be, I think. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, um, you know, I think that's very unfortunate to hear that happen to you. And someone like I, I know, you know, I know you and I see you and all that kind of stuff. It's, cr you know, I know you're not the kind of person to say, hey, I've got black friends or whatever, but I know you do. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a weird it's a weird thing because, you know, um, it, that unfortunately happens to people. So, and I, and I think it's terrible when it happens. I think, you know what that does? That makes it tough when we really come across people who really are prejudiced, who really are racist, you know, people who really, yeah, we, that's what makes it difficult for us to fight, to fight the real things that happen in life and in society, you know, and, and what, are, go ahead. You got some Asian blood too, is that correct? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, my. Uh, I'm like. You know, I'm about. Um, I'm gonna say I'm like forty eight percent African or something like that. And then the yeah. rest of it is. Um, the rest of it is mixed. My mom's Indian. You know, uh -huh. so on on her side, she and she's not completely Indian either. You know, she's got like uh -huh. uh, uh, several things in there. But but because of that, I've got like um, Asian, like Chinese blood, Indian. I've got Polynesian blood. So, yeah, you know, but I think we're all like that, you know, and, and, you know, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. and, and here's a good example, color also helps, like, you know, if, uh, if Obama looked like his mother, we would have never heard the guy's name. Hello. <laughs> 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 uh, he was like, if Obama looked like his mother. Yeah, that's true. Let me say something. People feeling guilty, you know, thinking like this will be, well, it's about you to turn them all kind of, this will be historic, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I guess it was, but. We said pick somebody like uh, uh, Ben Carson or uh, Alan Keyes or somebody like that. So. Yeah. Uh, hold on one second. Walter wants to say something. What was it, Walter? Can you imagine if Obama's mama was still alive? Yeah. You know, most, I would say most people that that of color that voted for Obama, a lot of them don't even know his his mother was white. So Walter. That. Walter is saying, can you imagine if his mom was alive? Because uh, Walter feels like people didn't, you know, a lot of people didn't know that his, that his mom uh, was white. Um, you know what I say to that, Walter? I think he was that... raised by his white banker grandmother. Yeah, no, I, I get that, you know. Um, no, and, that, and, and he went to Chicago to get his, his roots. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I understand where you're coming from. You know, the, the way that... Um, that I look at this is that uh, this is a weird thing, right? It's like with me, for example, um, I get into this a lot with Indian people. This is the best way for me to explain this to you. When I meet, cause you know, my mom's Indian, but she was in the Caribbean. So lots of Indians left India and went to other places and they went, they, they came really to the Caribbean and, and my mom's fa family obviously came to Guyana where I was born uh, as indentured serv uh, servants. So they weren't slaves, but they were close to that. Next thing. Yeah. And lots of people did that kind of stuff for a bunch of different reasons. So, so yeah. So when I, when I meet people who are Indian from India and I say to them, yeah, you know, I'm Indian. Um, they look at me and they go, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. So I get like, no, not only that, they figured like, well, they say, well, okay. So you're, I mean, if, if you look at certain things about me, you can, you can tell that I'm, that I'm Indian. But even if they look at that, when they ask me where my mom's from in India, um, you know, and I explained to them that she was, you know, her family's from India and they know where they come from and all that, but she was born outside of India. Then they go, no, you're not Indian. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, Indians have like a caste system. Oh, there still is a caste system in India. Yeah, yeah. Indians have this like caste system. And, um, you know, basically they look at you as like the untouchables, the people that had to leave there. So they, they you know, they put you in that situation all the time. Now, the reason why I say this to you is that, so when people ask me my ethnicity, you know, unless I really know that person and I take time to break it down to them, I just say I'm a black guy. 
And, and I think that I'm not trying to defend Obama, but I think that same thing goes for him, that ultimately it doesn't matter like if he had. It, 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 it does technically matter. Yes, I get it. That's what the genetics are. But no matter what, when you look at him, you can you can tell he's mixed or whatever. But in the end, you see a black guy. You don't see a white guy. But that that yeah, that. They work for him, so. Yeah. 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 And maybe it worked because you saw someone that was kind of like in the middle. Hold on a second. What are you going to say, Walter? Yeah. No, I, I'm just saying that that played to his advantage. Yeah, absolutely. That did play to his advantage. Uh, now, what I, was about it, but what I was saying about uh, his mother not being around, she was a nutty leftist. I mean, just a, a, a uh, just a, uh, and uh, it would have been another Jimmy Carter. Yeah. So, so Walter is saying that if his mom was around, she was kind of like a, a, a nutty leftist, leftist a, a very radical, and that might have not um, sat so well his, with people. Would have had his, her own Billy Carter. Sure, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Now, here's the flip side of this whole thing. I think. If, if you look at Obama, both sides of his family, this is the weird thing. You know, you could probably find people on the white side of his family that owned slaves, you know, in the family line in the past, right? On, on the white side. But the funny thing is you can probably find people on the African side of his family that also owned slaves. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. <laughs> They're so good. They never taught me this in school. You know, grade school, you know, history class, all through high school, all this stuff. If you look at the 1860 U.S. Census, there was over 10,000 black people in the U.S. that owned slaves in the year 1860 <laughs> when they took that census. They never mentioned that. Yeah. And also, I think one of the things that we don't learn in history books, and, and, and unfortunately, like uh, the book Roots, I read it. You know, I watched the series when it came out. I was here in the 80s when it was on TV. But I read the books, all of them. And the problem with the with the book Roots is that that is a very small percentage of what happened in slavery. I'm always trying to tell people this because I think that a lot of people here in America don't understand that very a very small percentage of slaves became slaves by white guys going to Africa and just kidnapping them out of the blue. That was a really small percentage. Most of the slaves became slaves by being sold by their own people into slavery en masse. So in other words, they sold entire villages into slavery. Yeah, you know, if you were kidnapped, if you were out walking in the bush or something like that and you were kidnapped, how did your wife wind up there or your kids and all that kind of stuff? They took the whole village, yeah. Yeah, it didn't happen that way. And in the Caribbean people, you know, we know for a fact that they came with, um, you know, they came with all kinds of tools and seeds and stuff like that because they knew they were told, hey, pack up, you're getting on these things. And then beyond that, if you really study, if you there's places in Africa, but you don't have to go, obviously, to Africa. If you really study this, you're going to find out that Africans, specifically West Africans, sold their own people into slavery. So I'm not, I, I'm not saying that we should beat them up, we should hate them, we should burn down, tear down any statues to them. We're all culpable and responsible for slavery, on top of which... The, that kind of slavery that we're talking about was a long time ago, and most of the people that were physically involved in that do not do no no longer exist on the face of this planet. Nope, yeah, that's true. My, uh, my family they came over from Ireland back during the big potato famine, yeah, which was was past that. But uh, you know, a lot of the Irish were used to slaves when they came over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like I said, it did your service. They had to pay off their, their trip over and had to work. Them. Yeah, and, and it was very expensive to keep up a, to. It was very expensive to keep up a slave. There's there's nothing about me that believes in slavery. The reason why I believe in guns is because I don't believe in slavery, you know. And I believe that. Absolutely. That should never happen. We should not own other people. You know, we should not own other human beings. That's the, the worst thing in the world. It does happen and it happens because of us. You know, every every race that exists on this planet has been enslaved by either their own people or other people or a combination thereof. That's true. Every single race. So and the way for us to deal with that, I think, is not to pretend that the past didn't happen. 
but to realize that it did happen, to be reminded of that, to spend our time, you know, studying that, looking at that and saying, well, how do we avoid ever, you know, ever being in that situation again? I think when it comes when it comes to what's happening right now, my personal belief is that we're being kind of like separated into into issues. It's not, and about, if they, it's not about slavery or. Yeah. Yeah. Walter is saying it's not about slavery. It's, about, it's like gun control. It's not about guns. It's about control. Yeah, he says that it's not like with gun control, it's not about guns, it's about control. And I think that's what's happening. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they say like right now, if we can get rid of, if we can get rid of these guys, if we can say that these people are the enemy because they believe in, in these statues and, and these Confederate statues are related to slavery and it's a bad thing and then we get rid of that, then, and then we go, okay, okay, so we'll give that up, you know, so then they don't have to worry about that anymore. Then one day they're gonna say, you know what? We really don't need Christians. You know, Christianity is a problem here. Maybe one we should day? take that away. <laughs> one day. Yeah. Just like they did in the Jews, you know, in the, uh, all through history, but particularly the Germans, you know, in the 30s and early 40s. And, and the Jews, they don't go, uh, they don't want pastors tore down and all those things. They mm -hmm. want to preserve that so the world will know what happened. You know, there's no yeah. need to try yeah. to destroy history. Yeah. It's there to learn from. Absolutely, absolutely, and we and when we learn it, we we need to accept in our minds that this was a complicated thing. This wasn't a this wasn't a cut and dry easy thing. Horrible things happened for sure. There were horrible, terrible things that happened, but this is a lot more complicated than we think it is. With us never having to live in 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 those times, with us never being able to get into a time machine and go back and and really look at what was happening here and what went on, and what the government sure. was doing, and you know why people were uh, went along with this, and who owned slaves? Like you said, you know there were ten thousand black people in America that owned slaves. So lots of pe lots of black people in America today are descendant of those ten thousand people. Exactly. You know, and most so, of the people that fall on either side in the Civil War didn't own slaves. You know, they're just poor people trying to get back. You know, like the guys in the South, they knew they was, it was, it was the Confederate States was a sovereign country at that time being invaded from the North. You know, and, and the people in the North, they didn't want to come down here and fight. They had to draft them. You know, they invented the draft to make people come down here and fight. And yeah. It's just bad all around. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, you know, we could probably talk about that for a long time. I want to get back to guns. I'm sure people uh, have uh, more questions out there. What do you think about what's going on in the industry when it comes to like um, a, a lack of, how, how should I put it? I think it's a lack of innovation in the industry, especially if you look at AR-15s and stuff like that. Everyone was making them. Go ahead. Yeah, everybody is brother, but you know, we brought about AR-15s one time, you know, but when you write your 50th review of an AR-15, they're all good. They all work. They pretty much got to design now. Now, now, you know, after decades of the things, you know, they work and they work well. And, uh, uh, but, you know, people like, even companies like, uh, you know, Mossberg and, and people like that, you would never think making AR-15s. Uh, everybody's making AR-15s. I would rather see, you know, I would rather see somebody make the game over here. You know, that's a great weapon. The what? It's on the AK pictures, on the AR pictures. That's, that's a great weapon. There's a lot of good weapons all over the world. You know, I think every American should own an AR-15 because it's important that, that you know how to use it. One day the government might stick one in your hand and say, "Go to work and and, and spare parts and ammo is as close as your nearest dollar here if you ever need them." Uh, except everybody should own it, but there's also <laughs> a lot of other great designs out there. Yeah, but like you said, a very little innovation. I see coming forward these days. Yeah. So, is there? Um, I, I'm sure there's a few things though that you think, um, you know, that you think out there are cool. There's got to be, a, you know, a few of those. Any cool things out there? You think? Well, I love labor guns. Of course, they're not they're not nothing new, but I love labor action. That just it's my thing. Labor action and, and single action revolvers. But you know, about the uh, there's some different designs. You know, like Caltech for one. Uh, they're innovative down there. They don't have a lot of capacity to produce stuff. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, Ten years ago. they're thinking, you know, they're, they're not just doing another Me Too gun. Anytime Caltech comes out with a gun, it's not a copy of something else. Yeah, I, I, they, they come up with some innovative things. 
Yeah, I think I, I've seen recently that you've done something on the Caltech CMR, which is their the rifle version of the um, the pistol that they have, the twenty two Magnum pistol. Uh, what did you think about that? Well, I was going to have to buy it when I was done with it, so uh, I'm bad about doing that. No, but I love the twenty two Magnum cartridge for one thing, and I love that gun. You know, when I uh, when I first got the uh, the PMR thirty years ago, I thought this would make a great little carbine. Uh, one that I really loved, I went to the factory and shot there. Before they introduced the PMR-30, I shot a full auto version of it. It had a wire buck stock on it. And I thought, like, you know, carbine just, it felt like the pistol with a longer barrel and a buck stock would have been great. But the, uh, uh, of course, the CMR uses the same magazine. But these innovative designs are good. They're, they're, they're RFB, the rifles like that are really good. A little uh, Bondon Wolf Up, which is uh, a robot design. Right. Well, that's an interesting design. I'm not sure uh, if I would want to own one or not. Uh, and it's because the ammo out there, you got to use the right ammo because that thing will it'll pull the case off the bullet because it pulls backwards. Right. And it does it so violently. If it's not good uh, uh, ammo, but the bullet is, is still good in that case. Right. So. Right, so you're talking about the Boberg, which um, I don't know if uh, folks know what that is. Um, was it was the company name? Because there was a company that developed this pistol. It's a Bopa pistol. What was the name of the company, Walter? Yeah, it's re like reverse re reverse recoil. It's, it works completely backwards from what you're used to. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a Bopa. But then I think Bond Arms bought the yeah. rights to that gun or bought the company, right? And they're working on getting it back out. Yeah, so now they're developing it, and I think you have a video where you were actually shooting. It's is it is it in production right now, or is it still a prototype? It is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in production now. We shot it back, it's been almost a year ago, we shot it down at Lake Mary, Florida, at an event down there, and it worked really well, but uh, they are in production. In fact, my brother's got one. Uh, Boge, he's got one, uh, just recently got it. It works good, he said, he, he confirmed you just used right ammo. Use ammo that's not that well, it's not in there tight, it'll, it'll pull the case off of it uh, when it's pulling it back to feed it. But, uh, but it, it's an innovative design, uh, okay? So it's you know, like you said earlier, there's not much innovation out there. Don't say, I mean, everybody, you know, somebody will copy somebody's design, but you know, most of the pistols out there are pretty much copying John Brown's design, uh, you know, short recoil, uh, tilting brown pistol. Uh, but that's a, and, and now everybody wants to make a a plastic frame gun, but that's what the market demands. So, right. uh, most companies are trying to feed that market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, someone here, let me see who's asking about it. Uh, Mr. Saving the Day asked, What do you think about the Chris Vector? I'm sorry about the what? The Chris Vector. Oh, I like the Vector. That's a good design. I love it. Mm -hmm. auto. For semi auto, it's, you know, it's kind of heavy uh, for a semi auto 45 pistol. But, uh, uh, I've shot the full auto one. It's a, it's a nice sub gun. I really like the design. Yeah, you know, every every year when we go to Shot Show, I always go to uh, I go to Media Day. One of the things I do is I go to the Chris booth just to shoot the full auto because uh -huh. they have a full auto and it's uh, also suppressed and it's their ammo <laughs> uh -huh. and it's like the and most beautiful thing in the world. That design for full auto. I, I love yeah. the thing full auto. For semi auto, I'd rather really carry an IG weapon. You know, just because it's uh, it, it's just so much lighter and smaller. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. That gun was meant to be full auto. It's too bad we can't have those things, you know, easily anymore. We can't have them if you're willing to spend the money and jump through all the hoops that you have to jump through for it. But, um, yeah. you know, that gun was meant to be full auto and suppressed, in, in my opinion, the, the Chris Vector. So, and, you know, no, Chris Vector's for everyone. In a short barrel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Walter says also in a short barrel. Absolutely, that's where that gun really shines. It's too bad we can't do that. Uh, you know, there's things that are close because, like now, you can do because of the sig brace. You can it could be a pistol. You can definitely you can definitely do the paperwork and get it suppressed. And uh, you know, we shouldn't. I don't think we should really have to do the paperwork to get a, put a suppressor on it. And um, you know, there's companies making these binary triggers, which I know you also did a video and at least one of the binary triggers, right? We did, yeah. <laughs> what did you think about the binary trigger? I like it. You know, it took me about a magazine to get used to that thing prior when I, when I released it, but uh, 
Once you do it's fun, kind of like a slide fire. You know, once you get used to it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, Mr. Holster wants to know, what do you think is the best lever gun nowadays, or lever gun, I should say? Lever. Best lever um, <laughs> yeah, I, I said lever gun, but but that's like my accent slipping in there a little bit. So the best lever gun nowadays, um, uh, something, and then something about the Winchester from Japan, but I don't fully understand what that is. Well, you know, Winchesters that are made in Japan, um, they're as good as any Winchesters ever built. Personally, you know, I love the Winchester being made in the USA. Just apparently, it's a Winchester. You know, it should be made in the USA. But I understand that, you know, it's a world market. They're making them only where they have to. Uh, Marlin's quality's got really good uh, in the past couple of years. You know, for a while, Marlin quality just sucked. And I was at a rider event in South Carolina with the Freedom Group. You know, each guy got up and told his thing, Remington guy. And uh, the Marlin man made his talk. There's several riders there. He said, I got any questions or comments. And nobody said nothing. I said, well, yes, right. I said, no. Your quality sucks. <laughs> and he just hung his head and, and uh, you know, he admitted it. He said, we thought it would be easy to take this uh, design. It was made on old machinery, put it on new CNC machinery and make it work, you know. But uh, a lever gun is uh, really, it's a lot more complicated than a bolt gun. But they've got the quality up now. The, the Martin, the Jamaica Bell, are really good quality. They work, they work well. I love the Henry stuff. Well, Henry's got some good case hardening in it. Things are that, uh, uh, I just like all of the big horn. They're not making many, but uh, you know, you're not going to sell a lot of three thousand dollar guns, but they're real nice guns. You've got five hundred Smith and Wesson or the four sixty. So, how many good lever guns out there now? Yeah, I think it it probably depends on what you're looking for, right? Um, if you want yeah. side loading, if if that's a big deal to you, you can you can go with Marlin. Um, you know, I think Henry makes great quality. They stand behind what they make. Their guns are beautiful. Yep. Um, you know, and then there's, it, it just really depends what you're looking for, like price levels, all that kind of stuff, right? Sure. The, the Rossies are good guns. But, yeah. And uh, I guess you'd say they're American made because they're made in South America. But uh, I hate yeah. the little safety <laughs> they put on the boat, but I buy all the, the pre-safety Rossie Lever 357s that I run across. Yeah. 16 inch guns. I've got several of them. Yeah. What were you going to say, Walter? I was curious why Marlin stopped making the uh, 38 357 lever guns. Yeah. So Walter wants to know why Marlin's, why do you think Marlin stopped making the 357 lever guns? Yeah. 338, 357. Oh, they're yeah. They're starting to make the 1894 ink step. You know, they, they did one thing smart. You know, when, when, when they screwed up the quality, they stopped production and they're bringing the guns back one at a time. And uh, uh, they are just starting to make those the three fifty seven now again, uh, which is a good thing. And I'm glad to see them coming back. Oh, okay. That, that's a popular lever lever gun in thirty. I wish they would make the thirty nine again. You know, the twenty two long rifle version. That's the sweetest little lever gun ever made. If I had to pair it in one gun, and I've got several, uh, it would be a modern thirty nine. Just because I could do ninety five percent of what I need to do with a twenty two, and that's just a, it's a slick little lever gun. Oh, okay. It's always been expensive, even when it was invented back in the early part of the 20th century. It was an expensive gun compared to everything else, but, but the quality is there. Just a nice gun. Oh, okay, so uh, as 22 goes, that's a pretty sweet 22. Yes, and they, all the, all the uh, machine reports sent me to be crazy, but in New York, in the Remington factory, they just hadn't, they hadn't decided if they're going to make it again or not. Okay. That looks like they never will. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, I got a few more things here, and then I'm, you know, because you, you've been hanging on with us for a while. So let me just uh, get up two more questions. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's that, that's probably good. So uh, Jack Thorfinson, <laughs> I probably said that wrong. Jack Thorfinson says hello. Do you know who that is? Uh, I do not. Okay, so he says hello. As for, everyone here in the chat wants to say what's up to you. Lots of guys out there saying how much. You know, they enjoy your beard, they enjoy the channel, they enjoy you as a person. So lots of love coming from the audience there. And you don't know this because, you know, you obviously don't have a computer. But while you're talking, Walter's been showing, he's got a lot of uh, 
you know, a lot of ordinances. <laughs> you know, Walters with Safety Harbor Firearms, and uh, you know, he makes he makes a, a fifty upper that goes on an AR fifteen lower. Yeah, I've talked to Jeff at Chuck. Yeah, yeah, he says he's spoken to you before, but he's showing lots of guns and he's showing, uh, you know, what is that you're showing, Walter? That's a bazooka, three and a half inch bazooka round. Yeah, he's showing a three and a half inch bazooka round <laughs> while you're talking. Oh, this, they got some cool stuff. I think Mr. Thorpe was in. I see you in some of the, uh, maybe on Facebook or some of the uh, labor gun uh, forums or something like that. The name sounds familiar. It's not a real common name, so I believe I do know of the guy, but I've never met him personally, I don't think. Um, I think he says he's met you at SHOT Show or something like that, right, Walter? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Next yeah, SHOT Show. Oh, 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 Thorfinson. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Jack. Yeah, I think it was Jack Thorfinson. But uh, you know what? I will make sure that you and Walter, uh, at, you're going to be at the next SHOT Show, right? Oh, yeah. If I'm alive, I'll be there. Okay. Well, well you know, hopefully we'll, we'll pray. We'll put in our requests. That you live a, uh, for another the, hundred years at least. Does he do the, the NASGW show? The whole show? Do you um do you do what show? NASGW. Uh, do you do the NASGW? I don't think so, right, Walter? No, no, no. He goes to Knob Creek. I don't know if you ever go to the creek. Coming up, yeah. No, I haven't. I've never been up there. Oh, okay. I've heard of it, but I've never been there. Oh, okay. You got to go to Knob Creek sometime. I've never been either, but you know we got to make a pilgrimage. So let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, here's the last question: What do you think about uh, 357 Magnum? Oh, 327 Magnum. 327. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I love that cartridge. When it first came out several years ago, I didn't have uh, I didn't have any ammo, but I had some empty cases and a regular revolver. I love the start of that thing. It's a good, powerful little cartridge. It's, uh, it's what the three, it's what the thirty-two H and R should have been when it came out. Uh, what in the eighties? But you know the guns weren't strong enough to handle it back then. The little H and R revolver, but but uh, it, it's a excellent cartridge. Everyone heard fires been after it. I hear the Henry's got a lever gun for it now, which I'd be anxious to try out. But I've struck several revolvers, uh, pre alarms, charter arms, and a Ruger. Okay, I've got to try that out one of these days. All right, you know what, Jeff? Um, you know, you've been really kind to hang out with us for all this time. I want to thank you on behalf of myself, Walter, everyone else. I think you answered a bunch of questions. Um, you know, we got a lot of cool insight into what, you know, who you are and, and what you're all about. Um, is there anything that you would like us to, you know, what social media do you guys have? How, how do we support you? Well, we just got, we got uh, Facebook. I just got it under my name, Jeff Quinn. And uh, that's pretty much it. We got that in our, our website. And that's, that's about all we do as far as social media, is just a little bit on Facebook. Just go, I go there to kind of promote, uh, uh, promote our videos. Thanks. Oh, okay. So if anyone wants to follow you on Facebook, they just go follow Jeff Quinn. You'll accept them as a friend? Sure. I accept them right now. They only have 5,000 friends. And and I'm bumping up against every now and then I have to go through and delete some of the, you know, you know, chicks from Ghana that want to marry me and all that kind of stuff. But uh, to take on new friends. But, but sure, I'll take on did you say, did you say from, did you, you say from Ghana that want to marry you? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I get, get emails and Facebook requests from there. You know, they're like 18 and start to serve them on a woman marry do you know do you, <laughs> visa. looking for a visa? Do you know why the reason why I'm laughing, Jeff? You know where Lola's from? Do you know where Lola was born? Is that where she's from? Yeah, she was born in Ghana. Well, I think you got the only the last good one out there. I'm thinking this is some guy sitting in his mama's basement pretending to be some girl. Yeah, probably. Trying to scam me. Yeah, you know, nowadays there's like all these hot chicks trying to uh, friend request me on my personal uh Facebook page, and I know for a fact there's no hot chicks that wants to be friends with me. <laughs> I've seen some of them too, actually. Yeah. So, oh, what? What was that? You've seen? I mean, I've I've had some of those requests too, and I'm like, what? yeah, we're all all gun guys are getting those nowadays. So, yeah, I mean, you like, know. Um, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Now, Lola, Lola was. Yeah, Lola was born in Ghana, but you know, she left there when she was young. So. But, you know, that doesn't, I'm not trying to disparage, you know, the Ghanaian women that are trying to, you know, uh, trying to get their visa and come over to America. It's pretty rough. <laughs> you yeah, know. Yeah, they got to make it if they can, I guess. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so the best way to follow you on social media is Facebook, right, Jeff Quinn? That's right. Just Jeff Quinn over there. Right, absolutely. And then other than that, they should just go to gunblast.com. That's right, yeah. And then you guys are gunblast.com, like written out.com on YouTube, right? Right. Awesome. That's right. Awesome, Jeff. I I, I want to thank you, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Okay, I'll see you in Chuck Georges. All right, brother. It was good talking to you, man. I'll I'll, I'll uh, catch up with you soon. Okay. All right. Thanks, thanks. Stay healthy, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. Okay. So they there you go. I mean, that was pretty cool, man. He was he's on here with us for <laughs> pretty much two hours. What it's do you think, Walter? Hours. Yeah, it's oh, been close to it. It's yes, yeah, it's like. Uh, our time, East Coast time, it's uh, 8.54. I think we started around 7. He's a good yeah. guy, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you're looking on his Facebook page here. He's got an old school Mustang, and he's got a new school Mustang on it. So he's yeah. all right. Um, yeah, Jeff has some nice toys, not just not just nice guns. He's got some nice stuff. There's a bunch of stuff. I forgot to ask him about um, his bunker. <laughs> oh, he's got he's got a man cave. Yeah, he's got a real legitimate bunker. You guys, if any, if you guys go follow him, if you can, he's probably like he said, he's reached the max of the personal friends that you can have on Facebook. <laughs> but if you are friends with him on Facebook, you'll see that he has um, he built up a bunker. They actually oh, cool. like. Dug a big massive hole, put a bunker in there, and all that kind of stuff. Really I cool. Send him a friend request, so hopefully I get in before they shut him down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you got to get him. You know, like you said, if when you you've got to be there when he if uh, if you don't get in, you've got to wait until he's culling the herd of all the African and other chicks. <laughs> or it's mostly dudes. Let's be honest. <laughs> Probably some Russian women looking for that too. You know? No, I think it's mostly dudes. <laughs> you know, uh, looking for ways to get some money. Ah, uh, oh, yeah, some Nigerian kings or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Nigerian prince that's uh, you know, just needs a convenient bank account to put his put gajillions his oil, <laughs> oil money in. Yeah, that's right. yeah, gajillions of dollars. But Jeff's a really good guy, man. Yeah, no, and like I said, I met him. I think the first time I met him was like when we did shot in two thousand three. He just walked up the table, and and I just didn't follow up with him about getting him some of my stuff to review. So, and I've seen him since then. He goes, yeah, sure, send it to me. So um, I just, yeah. you know. Yeah, we got to work that out. And, you know, like he was talking about Bond Arms. I actually brought in a Bond Arms guy. Check that out, guys. Yeah. yeah now, that, now that we're not like, uh, we could throw up, we'll throw up some guns here for the next couple of minutes before we go so you guys can see some guns. That's all. Well, now you're yeah, gonna that's all, that's you obviously go. all safe right there. But you could put 410 up in this bad boy. Have you shot it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lola has a video on this. Oh, okay. Okay. Because yeah. I've I've shot many a little 410. Yeah. So. This is actually um this is actually Lola's gun. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. That I uh, and she has 410. I just took it out of there. Oh, she okay. keeps this like uh, loaded. <laughs> well, that's uh, yeah. That's cool. This is probably like her snake gun and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, two legged snakes, as I say. Oh. <laughs> so what you what do you have? What do you have? You might get me get a gun now. I don't and look, Lola. Lola even has like a. While, while you're getting your gun, I'll show you guys. Look, Lola's got a. That's pretty as a muscle. Got, yeah, she's got that little. I, I, sat, I sat this whole time and was good. You notice that was good the whole time. I yeah, didn't. you were good, Walter. You were good. I saw you. I saw you showing off a little bit though. Well, I had to because I was getting. I was starting to yawn. So. Um, yeah, you were showing off your stuff. What What do you have over there? Oh gosh. What do you have? Oh look, while you're going to figure out what you have, look what I brought in. Ooh, that's Check pretty. That. That thing's Pam. You know what Pam's made right? Yeah. <laughs> um, that, yeah, that's Keg, yeah, Keg 12, Safety Ever Fire. Keg 12, yeah. That's a Mossberg, Mossberg base one, uh, threaded for, a, threaded oh. for, the, for the dreaded um, silencer uh, co, uh, yeah. can. Lola said you're saying you're good, and she's saying that you were barely good. <laughs> so what are you talking about? All right, let's go get something. <laughs> You, <laughs> Lola says you were barely good. You were just on the cusp of being good. <laughs> Peggy's laughing in the other room too. That I was good. <laughs> he wasn't good. She says. All yeah, right. you, you were good. Okay, what you got? Show okay. us some guns. Show us some guns. Porn. This is mag porn. Okay. This is a uh, uh, dual MG thirty four. I think MG seventeen and fifteen. Uh, German magazine. Um, you know, like 50 rounds on each side. Oh, okay. Wow. Eight millimeter Mauser. 
these things are kind of very cool in German. Um, That's nice. Yeah, these are super well you made. Got some bird feathers on it. Yeah, it's got some dust on it. Sorry, I'm sorry, but um, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's been sitting around for a while. I don't have the eight hundred three solid shooter says that's a titty mag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's one way you could put it, I guess. Um, Screaming Skull Saloon says he saw that in Star Wars: The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, he probably did. Yeah, because all our yeah. guns are German in there, except for the yeah. Sterling. Right, right, right. Let me remind everyone that's joining us now or just came in recently, please click the like button. Like it. Share, subscribe. Yeah, share this Share this video on social media. We're going to be going on here for a little while, showing off some gun stuff. Okay, yeah. what's this? What's that? A, uh, like an MG42 or MG34, 50 round. I drum guess you can make an assault drum because it's always attached, got 50 rounds in it. And, and an uh -huh. MG34, 50 rounds last like uh, done so um yeah it's pretty fast but it's a world war ii one just to have an example of it i have one very cool and and i guess that's like world war ii od green yeah yeah well it's been painted a few times in its lap in its history it looks like at least mm -hmm. a couple but yeah i think the green is may, might it's either green or like a dark blue or black that it was originally maybe so okay. if, if it could speak it would be very interesting i'm sure right 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 okay i mean if i could have some of my old guns talk like this old luger that I've been messing with when I when you oh hold it. that up let's see okay so you're a uh, you okay this is the ghetto luger that um babyface p put back together and today I got it's kind of cool like that man oh skeletonized yeah yeah skeletonized that looks cool <laughs> um today I got a new uh, set of grips for it that uh, came from uh, actually came all the way from Latvia oh so, cool oh it's where where's Mac isn't Mac in um I believe that where's Mac right now he isn't he in Latvia or one of those places he's yeah. somewhere in Eastern Europe I, oh I really I, okay I Hope think so uh someone someone could tell me Mac is because I know that um uh, uh, Mike Deddy is also over there with him they're at some gun factory somewhere in Eastern Europe because I've seen Mac throwing up a bunch of stuff Cool. I hope he gets to shoot some cool guns. Oh yeah, I'm so jealous of him. Matt gets to go to all these cool places. Yeah. You know, I mean, he could have totally put me in a suitcase. Uh, you know, <laughs> I would have traveled in there just to go job. over. But I know that he's throwing up. Um, he's throwing up pictures, and I think there's video and stuff like that. Oh, Slovenia. He's in Slovenia. Slovenia. That's part Kevin of. Kevin Dufresne says he's in Slovenia. So Lawrence Lerwick wants to know, Walter, can you build a drum mag for the SHTF 50? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> bold action drum mag. That would be exciting. I mean, yeah, but I probably yes. Would I? Would I? Would I commit suicide at the end? Probably so because it was <laughs> just going to be too much work. Too much work. Yeah. Right, right. I couldn't work the bolt handle fast enough. Yeah. Oh, uh, so Kevin's saying that Max at the uh, Rex One factory. Yeah. So there's going to be a badass video coming out of that. Slovenia, which is part of the former Soviet. I mean, Chuck. I think it's Czechoslovakia, yeah. I think yeah. that's where uh, Melina is from, Slovenia, if I'm not mistaken. Melina Trump. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, very really nice. She was, she was born yeah. there, yeah. Okay. So, what, what are you looking for? Something else now? What do you want to do? So, you think Mac is going to be able to bring us back some supermodels? Well, you know, I don't know. Some future supermodels? <laughs> I don't know, you know. <laughs> um, Screaming Skull Saloon wants to know what huge rifle was in the original RoboCop movie. Um, um, I don't know which one. There's a bunch of guns in there. Like what? On um, um, That they were hand-holding or that was on the robot? You know, the, the big RoboCop 50 cal, which um, it's been made by a couple different companies that are different, different names, but I cannot for life me remember yeah. that. Lawrence Lerwick says that's where the binary trigger comes in. So can you okay? Can you make a drum mag for the SHDF fifty and a binary trigger? <laughs> it's gonna work the bolt. <laughs> oh, that's that's the that's the electric finger. Okay. Thing it does. Uh, I I got your solution. Uh, just make it um semi auto. Right? Just make it semi auto, man. What's up? <laughs> I was Come thinking, on now. I was thinking how how hard how large could you make an open an open bolt fifty cal, like a like a like um a recoil i mean a um a slam fire i guess it, mm -hmm. it would be ginormous because of the recoil i mean the pressures and stuff so those are the kind of thoughts i have when i'm bored sitting around so yeah okay you got any other guns because i got one more i got one more if you well, don't why don't you, why don't you whip uh, it out I'll, and go, I'll go to mine so here i'm whipping it out oh wait hold on a second go ahead whip here it we out. go check this out 
I'm here still. This is my 22 build that um, Babyface and I did not too long ago. How about this? Get this? Huh? What do you got? Well, this is going back in time, son. This is a Hawkin black powder. Okay, black let's powder. see what you got. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, I have never shot it, actually. Is that walnut or something? Walnut, walnut and brass? Something. Some kind of wood. Octagonal barrel. Yeah, looks... yeah it's actually a Thompson um, Thompson Center. It's wow. a 54 caliber. Wow. So it's a big, got a big old hoe. Yeah, that wood is furniture grade. Yeah, that's pretty. This thing is Pam. I Like I said, I bought it from a guy. Just came wow. out, stopped by the shop one day and was looking to sell some stuff. And um, I can't help myself with stuff like this. So I went yeah, ahead and no, bought that's it. That's beautiful. We got we to gotta take it out and bust some, do some black powder shooting. Yeah, man. Yeah, I've never actually done the black powder thing. So oh, you'll like it. You'll have fun. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, it's cool. Yeah. So here, let me show let me show my twenty two. I opened up the stock. So this is a this is a twenty two that um that Babyface and I we did a video on this that's up there. That's a can on the end of that. Um, it actually has. If you look at it, it's got an integral barrel, integrally suppressed barrel Ooh. from uh, YHM, right? Ah. Lola, I think it's the integral barrels from YHM on this. You know, and then this is the Arrowhead stock. Yes. Customized for Hank Strange. Check that out. Lasered into that thing there? Yes, yeah, lasered in, and then we put like this, uh, some kind of lithium pen or something. We put it in there, but this is called the Arrowhead stock, so you could drop a Ruger 1022 uh, receiver into it, ah. and then you could put on any um, stock that you want. Okay, let me guess. That, aren't, that, that optic is from Primary Arms. Yeah, primary arms optic. Is that for twenty two LR or is that? For yeah, this is uh. I think you saw. I think you saw. No, this is not. No, this is not like a specific twenty two LR. Um, if you're wondering if this is one of those things that I've got a code for, that if you're buying it, um, I think there is a code for this one. What is this though? This is the um, pack two and a half by. So the PAC two and a half by. And in the description of all these videos, Lola's putting all those codes. So if you guys are looking for a primary arms optic, uh, you, you know, check out the description and you might get a link that will take you there. And when you buy it, you'll get the rings or the mount or whatever and free shipping. So there you go. It's in the description. Um, this, this one's in here. But this is not a 22. I think they just came out with a new 22, but I haven't seen it. So they came out with a new uh, 22 optic I heard but I got to I got to find out from uh Dimitri that was on. Yeah, so this is the two and a half compact AR15 scope with uh CQB ACSS reticle on it. Oh. Yeah. So there you go. It looks so it's a nice little it's a nice little setup, lots of fun to shoot, man. Got the ATI stock in the back? Uh yes, ATI, the lightweight in there, folding, you know, all that kind of good stuff. I just need, I wish I had a binary trigger for 1022s, man. Yeah, you need to get that electric finger, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sold on that electric finger yet. We'll see. I'm just kidding. We'll man. see. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100% sold. I don't, I don't think anybody's been sold on that electric. Yeah, so check it out. That's how it falls. There you go. Where'd the, uh, where'd the hinge come from? Was that from, um, um, I don't know. I can't remember the name of the company. Local hinge. Yeah, it's um, UTG, so, is it? somebody here. Pro it's probably UTG or something yeah, like I've that. I've got one uh, ones at the shop that I bought to see how they yeah. built them, and that thing is scary, scary crappy. So um, No, then maybe the, this is probably not UTG. This is probably pretty good quality, but I can't remember yeah. uh, where the heck it came from. Yeah, I think uh, the, Too the many. UTG one was made in, uh, I think, the, the – the, the the shop that's lower than China, I think. So yeah, I know the upper is uh, Tactical Innovations. Check that out, Tactical cool. Innovations. That's cool. On the upper, so there you go. That's a build. We've got a video on that that you guys can check out and enjoy that video. So what you got, Walter? What do you got? Oh, no, you, it's my turn now. Did oh. you get something while I was doing all of this? Well, I was sitting there stroking it. Um, oh, let's see. <laughs> so let's see here. How I'll tell you. Oh, you know. Go, uh, go ahead. How about some, how about some pro joke? Projo porno. So what was that you were showing? Well, what is that thing? This right here now? Mm -hmm. This is a 40 millimeter. Oh, excuse me. Uh, 
Uh, wait a minute. I might be. I could be mistaken. Uh, let me double check my. Uh, it's been a while since I pulled this thing out. Yeah, that's what she said too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, if she says it's been a while since she pulled it out, you should. You need to worry. Well, I can tell you the proto <laughs> was made in 1942. So um, I'm having a I'm having a brain fart here, but I'm thinking it's 40 millimeter, like you'd use in a. Uh, oh hell, uh, uh, like. One that no, it's not that. Okay, I've got to go back and do some research. Okay, while but, you're doing well, that, let me give a shout out to everyone who's hanging out. Uh, Joe Carpenter is in there. The Tyvin Show, uh, Tango Hunter, <laughs> Lawrence Lerwick, Robert Lee, Screaming Skull Saloon. Um, we've got uh, Chris B. You know, we got. Uh, let me see who else is in here. Al Cervic. Which we went over that. I'm still probably saying it wrong. Okay. Now Chervik, I stand Al Chervik. We've got uh, Mr. Holster. Mr. Holster. Mr. Holster is hanging out. Kevin Dufresne. Yeah, we got a bunch of cool people. 803 Salad Shooter. On and on. If I if I didn't say what's up to you, shout me out right now. Exhale is in here tonight. Exhale is saying he's in here tonight. Greg 90 98K. Just shout me out right now and I'll say what's up to you. All right. Okay. okay. Did correct. you fit that thing out, Walter? This is 37 millimeter. Okay. And this empty case here is for the 40 millimeter, like you see in World War II, the ACAC -AC guns. Boom, 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 shooting at aircraft. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Like the A um, AC-130 uses to uh, shoot all the guys from the gr from the thing. They have one of these, and it feeds it from a magazine to go boom, 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 boom. Obviously, it goes boom, boom. It's a gun. But um, yeah. <laughs> but, sorry, I have to I have to make the sound effects. Like, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Chris Bullis is here. You know, Rebel Sapper is here. Mister Saving the Day, oh, he's here. Lots Greg, of cool people. Vanessa Kitty is here. Greg the Tyvin the Tyvin Show is here in the in the building. <laughs> Greg, Greg ninety eight K, correct? Bofors. That's the proper terminology for that. The Bofors. Yeah, Steel Ringer. Says what's up to me? What what's up? up? What's up? What you know what, Walter? Guess what? I also have here. Look what I I, I got from the house. Oh yeah, you these, know. Are, these are classics, man. Uh, I oh, see I see Peggy sneaking into the building there. I saw Peggy sneaking in. Oh hey, here's one here too. Yeah. So should we should we give some of these away? What do you, well, what do you think? Should we give should we give some of these away? Who, I just got, who I doesn't? Have, go ahead. I have, I have a package heading your way right now that's got some of the new. Uh, Trump, Trump, Trump roosters in it too. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So those are the new ones. So these are about to become classics. Well, yeah, I still so, have plenty of the classics. If somebody. Yeah. Else. So Lawrence Lerwick wants one. I don't know if he. Okay, Lawrence, this one's yours. Okay. Let me see. I got. Let me see. I got a couple more here. So let me see how many I got. A minute. And this see, is three. Okay. I got. Okay. I got five more. I got five more. So who wants this one? What are you doing down there? Who wants this one? Let me know if you want this one. Hit me up right now. Speak now. Let me know. Gimmick. Who wants this? Yeah, you got to tell me that you want one. And, uh, you know, definitely make sure you're sharing. Make sure you're sharing this. Um, Kevin Dufresne says he wants one. Okay, so there you go. One's going to Kevin Dufresne. A lot of reflection. Yeah. What you guys have to do, uh, Joe Carpenter wants one. Okay, Joe Carpenter, you can have this one. I gave you that one. Um... Uh, Chris B wants one. Okay, Chris B. Exhale wants one. Okay, exhale. There you go. Um, did Kevin Dufresne? Did I, did I already say Kevin Dufresne? Okay, so everyone's saying they want one, but so, you know, hit up Lola right now. Otherwise, you know, we'll work it out. Oh, the if, I, there. if I didn't mention you, just hit up Lola anyway and let her know that you that you support the channel. You're always in there. Let her get your info. And what, what Lola will do is when we have more, she will send them to you. So if we run out, when we get cool stuff coming in, we'll send them to you. So we'll just we'll just do it that way. Right, Lola? Just uh, hit up Lola on social media. Lola's also on Facebook, guys. Oh, hey, I'm working on it. new um, Lola Strange on Facebook. That's where you hit her up on, on, on Facebook. On, Go ahead. What was that, Walter? That I'm working on a new uh, SHF uh, palm tree um, patch also, too. Oh, okay. Which will be the, the old style one was uh, it was okay. Clunk. So eight oh three salad shooter says he got his at NRA 
AM at the NRA show. So we know who we know 803 Salad Shooter. We're just probably like not putting the name and the person together. What did he get? He, he got, got he got one of the patches, so he must have come to the booth. He I either got it from me or you or yeah, both he of us. Got it from you. It wasn't me because I wasn't there. Oh, you weren't at NRA. Okay, so that was me then walking I'm working, around. I'm working that for I'm working on that for Dallas right now. Oh, next time. Okay, so I must have had a bunch of N of your patches at NRA. Yep. See, yep. see, Walter, always working, <laughs> always working for you, man. I know you are. I'm the job. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm here, right? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> well, that's so, why I haven't ate dinner yet. Yeah. Uh, Joe Carpenter says he's got to use daughter's Facebook. Yeah. Well, so that. Go ahead. What was that? That's all right. You know, whatever. Yeah. So that that was cool, man. That was fun. Hey, if you had an ex somebody's asked, Robert Robert Neely's asking about Core 15 in, in Ocala. Have you had an experience? Oh. Um, yeah, I've been up there. I've been up there a couple of times. I've actually tried to talk to whoever is in charge of the – I've seen the rifles they have up there, of course. I've seen them. But every time I've been up there and trying to talk to them, they just make me like – I ask like, hey, can I talk to someone that's in, you know, in marketing or whatever here because I'm on YouTube and I want to come in and maybe do a video on you guys or, yeah. you know, highlight you on my channel since you're on um, – Yeah. You know, you're in Florida and everything, and they just leave me standing there, and no one ever comes out. <laughs> so that's my experience with Core 15. Well, I hate to say, I'm not trying to say anything bad about them, but I've been there several times, and they've done that same thing. Well, so maybe it's time to move on from Core 15 then. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> I would love to. I would love to promote Florida companies and all that kind of stuff, but you know, that's their loss. Yeah, they have to be into it. They have to be yeah, into so it. So you're scared of. Uh, uncontrolled yeah. um, media and such yeah so chris bullis says he met me he met us at uh he met me at nra but he didn't get a patch you will get a patch we'll get some patches out and then when walter when the new one comes in we'll get i have to figure out something that we can do walter for like everyone who's always hanging out here with us obviously we've got the, the folks that support us on patreon and we send things to them all the time but um you know we've got some people here who do hang out that maybe maybe they're not on patreon but they do support us by coming and hanging out here in the shows all the time which is pretty cool right yeah yeah you've I mean, got to like make some kind of like uh you know oh, oh one just for the uh yeah we need to make like a stranger danger club or something i don't know what people say about frequent like, frequent flyer club kind of yeah some kind of hank strange thing Mile really? High Hank Strange Club, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that where we know the folks because I see the names all the time, but unfortunately when we close this thing, everyone that's hanging out with us, these comments aren't all necessarily in there. Oh, Strangeaholic, Strangeaholic. Yeah, that's what we need. We need to come up with something that we do, like a group. Maybe yeah, we should start like a some kind of group or something where we keep those names in there, and then we'll just send you guys cool stuff. You know, every now and then we'll hook you up. Whenever we get cool stuff, we'll hit you up with it. Yeah. Just for uh, supporting us. And and Al Chervik says he um, holding out for some Rand CLP. He just became a Patreon supporter. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Chris Bullis says he met us just walking around. Yeah. You know, that's like um, Gunblast was saying. That's what you're going to find, Walter, about the NRA show when you go next year. We did we did NRA in, in Pittsburgh in 2011 mm -hmm. as an exhibitor again, and I was kind of we walked around me and my son walked around the show, and yes, there was a lot of people and everything. But I was kind of um, I was kind of disappointed in the show. Uh, I guess I was expecting to s sell more stuff, but um, I didn't, and um, I don't know if it's the best place for. Um, I guess I, I guess maybe in Pittsburgh in the relation the the closeness to all these. Um, Northeastern states that don't have any any guns. I kept hearing that's illegal. That's illegal. And these old guys, you know, come up. That's oh. illegal. I'm yeah. Like, you know, I was like, no, it ain't illegal, buddy. Why would I have it on the table if it was illegal? So what I did, I was threatening, and next time I was gonna, and I used to have a, I had a description of the guns, but people wouldn't read it. They wouldn't read it. So I think what I'm gonna do next time, I'm gonna put naked girls by the description and see how many guys read the naked. You know, read the description after I put the naked girl sign. <laughs> uh, someone says strangers in the night. Yeah, I like that. I like um, um, uh, who is that? Strangers in the night. Strangers in the night. That's um, I'm my, my mom listens to that guy all the time. Is it uh, something Mathis? 
Oh, Johnny Mathis. Johnny Johnny Mathis. There you my go. Mom, my mom loved yeah. Johnny Mathis. Yeah. Strangers in the night, exchanging <laughs> glances. We were strangers in the night. Uh, Johnny Johnny exchanged. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, we de listen. I think um, I don't know about the Philly show that you went to, but in in Texas is going to be. Yeah, I'm, I, I, that's why I want to go. It's going to be on. I think like it's Donkey Kong. I think it's. I think the show has changed a little bit, even since eleven. I think. I think a lot of people are kind of using it like the ones that can't get into the shot show are using it like like little baby shot. Um, and plus plus the public's there too. So. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Al Chovic says that Sinatra does it better. Um, you know, my voice is not ready. I've been talking. I have to like so lube up the, I have to lube up the vocal cords first. Oh, yeah. So that was just, just that's there. what you get. Um, what you, yeah, Sinatra did do the Jack Daniels better probably than Johnny Mathis. So <laughs> uh, Yeah. But you know what? Listen, I, I'm not saying that you'll sell a bunch of stuff at the no, NRA no, show, no, but I, this time I'm not gonna go with that expectation. I'm going to show stuff. Yeah, but also you are you are going to meet a lot of gun guys, and the thing about it is they may not buy stuff right there, but just the ability to actually, you know, people need to put their hands on things. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> you know, so they like to be able to actually get their hands on this stuff and meet the people that are selling the thing, and I'll, I'll you know, I think people buy the person. You know? Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'll go into it with a different attitude this time. I think so. Yeah. Um, Besides, like I'm ever, people keep telling me I'm like an internet star now, anyways. So. Oh really? Are you are you internet <laughs> famous, really? <laughs> well, I have people tell me they, they watch it. They watch they watch the 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 show. I guess we'll say. Yeah. So I mean, I uh, you know my, my some of my close friends say, well now you're such you're on now that you're on the internet, can you still talk to me? Yeah. Well, Kevin Dufresne says he's a stranger, danger, non-Patreon, which is cool, but he'll be at Dallas. Yeah, man, I invite all you guys, if you can make it to Dallas, come see us. We're going to have a party like this, except it's going to be in person. And you're going to see that we're like this all the time. <laughs> if I can get tables, I mean, I haven't, I don't have my tables yet. Supposedly, they're, um, since I'm not a regular at this current time with the, with the show, they're going to start doing that in September. Oh, you better get some tables. They don't want us in the street. I, yeah, setting up like on the street corner. No, I, hopefully I can. I mean, I did the show in eleven, so hopefully uh, that helps yeah. a little bit. You know, there are some things in the street, but they're all like, um, they, for example, in um, in Atlanta, they had these big tractor trailers outside. Man, they oh, were yeah. selling uh, gear like clothing and all that kind of stuff outside. Yeah, it's gonna no. be you know, the the NRA show in in Dallas is gonna be pretty big, and then that's like uh, Colin Noir's hometown. Oh, so we get to so, swim in his pool and stuff, or what? Yeah, I might, I might be able to introduce you to him for a couple of seconds. I actually, I actually already met. I actually kind of met him already. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. We were at Shot Show, and we were, me and Will were walking around. We walked up to the um, the Mossberg booth, and he was sitting out front with one of the Mossberg guys. And I go, "Are you cold? Yeah, yeah. Hey, how you doing?" Bubba? And we were talking about the little shotguns and everything, and you know. Little conversation and off we went, you know. So yeah, Tyvin, the Tyvin show says, "Are you hiring an assistant for the show?" He's cheap. So if he's <laughs> if yeah, he's but, gonna, if you're gonna be at the show, Tyvin, you are welcome to come work in the booth. Yeah, but you know, he's not as warm as my significant other. So oh yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, no nobody beats. I, I like coming to the show just to hang out with Peggy. Your daughter is also there, who I don't ever see until shot. But is she gonna is she gonna come to NRA? Actually, Alexa. Oh, there's Peggy. Look, there's Peggy. Oh, that's so cute. Happy birthday, Peggy. I didn't get to say, like, oh, happy birthday. Those flowers are still kind of, some of them are still still doing their thing. So Nice, nice. Flowers. Oh, uh, yes, very nice. Yeah, maybe so, Alexa. She's, my daughter's in New Orleans, so Dallas isn't very far away. So. Nope, it's not. Yeah. Tell her to come hang out with us at the show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she'll work it. Yeah, hanging out shit. She'll be working. Uh, when I come, I'm hanging. I'm hanging out. Hanging out. When I, when I come over there. That's, so what's, okay, what's Will for at the show? Who's going to pay for a hotel room? Tell me that. <laughs> working. Her ass is working. <laughs> she's going to be wearing that, she's going to be wearing that firepower rig the whole time. Will. Oh, she'll be wearing the firepower rig? Okay, cool. So lots of, I invite you guys to come to the, to come to the booth. Just to take pictures with her and me in the fire. I'll I'll be there. I'm not. I'm not going to be in the booth the whole time, but yeah. I will be hanging around. Huh? You got to be out schmoozing. Yeah, I do a lot of schmoozing, especially at NRA. Yeah, yeah. No, I, but, I understand. I mean, I understand. I, 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 after seeing some of the other um, people going and you going and and 
and seeing some of the stuff going on, I said, yeah, I probably should do the NRA show. So. Yeah, yeah, we will be there, and we're doing um, in a couple of weeks. We're when when are we going to SEMA? <laughs> Isn't that coming up soon? Yeah, it is coming up soon. Actually, we got to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll be at SEMA show for everyone out there who likes cars. It's going to be me and Walter going to SEMA show. My buddy Mark that comes on here sometimes is probably going to be hanging out with us. So yeah, that's going to be that's going to be fun. We're going to be yeah, yeah, talking about cars. Yeah. I'm, hey, look at I. Hey, you know what? Got hey, lots of happy birthdays to Peggy from Vanessa Kitty, Chris B. Everyone says happy birthday. Uh, yep, yep, yep. She had a good birthday. Yeah. Um, what are you saying? Um, I was going to say, you know, I'm going to start a uh, a rat rod build. Oh, hold on. You know what, you know what I have? For what? For all you diesel people out there, I have a 671 Detroit um, diesel. It was a bus engine, actually, that my dad had. And, um, Ooh. So you've got the motor. You've got the motor. I got the motor, and my, my friend Sean, uh -huh. Darren, has a, a Diamond T truck cab. That he's oh, he's got the tub. Okay. He's got the badass old school uh, truck cab. And uh, so now we just got to gather more parts and gather more parts. And Are we making it a four before? No, no, it's it's, it's going to be it's going to be slammed down on the ground, baby. Oh, it's going to be slammed down. Oh, okay, so is it going to have like big fat rear tires and little oh, tiny? We're going to find some big front. old military tires to put on the back, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we'll see. It's you know it'll be a work in progress. It won't nothing. You know nothing. what I heard, you know what I heard. You know Jeep is going to make that truck that we saw, right? Yeah, the the, the yeah the seventh. The, what is the that F thing? The knockoff. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're calling it the Scrambler or something like that. Yeah, probably. Uh, um, yeah. Jeep yeah, is making that truck. A, that's a cool truck. That's a cool idea, yeah. Yeah. Also, Jeeps, uh, I think next year we're going to have the option for Jeeps to be diesel. That's a good option. I mean, it's good for yeah. off-road and stuff. And it's, you know, the, yeah. a lot of torque. You know, a lot of people like diesel. So it's yeah. just, it just gets um, – the problem with the diesel has been in this country is our stupid government and all our EPA rules. That's yep. That's what's really hindered everything. So, you yeah. know, when you go over to Europe and you get a diesel and you and you drive around and you're going and why isn't the gas gauge moving? And you're driving. It's like, why isn't the gas gauge moving? It's like, because you're getting about 45 miles per gallon in a full size sedan. You know, mm -hmm. it's like. Yeah, unfortunately, in Europe, the diesel is going to die out because they're like Germany wants to kill the diesel. Yeah. So, you know, you we'll, know see, um, we'll see what happens. Uh, it's going to be. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got like the Chinese company. I think it's Great Wall wants to buy. Um, yeah, not, not FCA. They don't. I think they don't want FCA. They want Jeep. <laughs> oh, oh, just, I wouldn't do that. They just want Jeep, but I don't think that's going to happen because Jeep is like the only profitable thing in there. I mean, I think um, you know, obviously, like Ram selling trucks or whatever, but everyone's selling trucks. I don't think Ram is selling the most. That's one of the reasons why I bought the Rebel because you know I like I don't want to have something that everybody has. So, well, yeah. although although I did want to I did want a Raptor. Look at me, yeah. But I mean, then you guys had to like go tell Lola how expensive the Raptor was. So thanks a lot for that one. I think she's smart enough to figure it out. Um, <laughs> I was try I was trying to I was trying to, you know, finagle her into getting her, yeah yeah getting the Raptor. So I came I came this close. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think you you know you you're not getting much more in a Raptor besides being a Raptor. Yeah, um, yeah, Wrangler with a V8 option that would be really nice, but I don't think that's ever. I don't know if that's going to happen unless you unless you uh, you can obviously you know squeeze a V8 in there. Yeah, Tyvon was saying about cutting down a a deuce in half and making it into a rat rod. Um, yeah, you can do that. I'm just going to try it. I think we're going to use a lot of. I think we're going to make a frame. I, I yeah, Walter's not going to cut down a deuce in half. Yeah. Well, no. Well, oh. actually, I have access to all that stuff. There's actually, yeah. there's actually a deuce frame sitting over. It. Oh, you do? Oh, but it's too heavy. It's too heavy. I'm gonna. Okay, but we need to do like a Mad Max build. That's what I want to do. You know, I've got the 440 that came out of the RV. Yeah, yeah. Because we're putting a different engine in there. We'll drop that in like an old Corolla or something like that. You know that. No, no. I want to put it in a four before. I want like a, you know, or I want to take like an old Camaro shell or something and then and then put that on top of a, you know, of the frame of something that's all wheel, you know, that's a four by four. Something from out of Mad Max. I want to build something Mad Max-ish hmm. with it. You know, it doesn't have to be a Camaro. Something that looks tough and then we put a big 440 in there. 
Uh, yeah. yeah let's see here. Hank needs a home visa. Lawrence Lurick says. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you? Why don't you just like uh, give me your home visa? How about that? <laughs> 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 there you go. There you go. It's a lot cheaper than the truck you just bought. So uh, yeah, I know. I know. I know you're gonna laugh about that. <laughs> by the way, you probably get a dozen of them for what you paid for that. Yeah, truck. I would like to get a Humvee. I would like to get a Humvee. Yeah, but I'm gonna rhino line the whole thing. Yeah, inside, I'm, outside, upside down. Yeah, I'm rhino lining everything. <laughs> and you're gonna see it seeming there's gonna be a lot more of that this year. So uh, yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, the new Bronco should be coming out, but um, I don't know, man. What is it? Uh, Tango Hunter, I guess he got to look at what it's going to look like. We don't know. Um, even like uh, there's going to be a bunch of cars coming out this year, next year. Yeah, the uh, the Jeep truck is the one. Uh, um, I keep thinking um, what the hell they call that. Um, not Commando. Um, I can't remember the name. Yeah, um, we saw it. At, we saw it at SEMA. Last year at SEMA. Yeah. Yeah. But didn't you say that Sean has one of those? Yeah, uh, yes, Sean's brother has a uh, one of those. Actually, two friends down here have, have one of those. So, yeah, um, yeah I tried to. I was going to be. I tried to buy one of those. Like, and here you go. We're back in 1980, um, when the military was selling them, I, I was trying to buy one when I was in high school, but I, I got out yeah. at the time. So, Crispy says he knows a guy back in the 80s that put a Camaro on a Blazer frame, and it was pretty cool. How about we took like an old, like Japanese frame? Gonna, what, what is this Camaro thing? It's called Camaro, Holmes. Oh, Camaro, okay. not Camaro. You say potato, I say potato. You're saying it like a, like a, like it's an in, like it's an yeah. American in. You Camaro. say tomato, I say tomato. It's a tribe or something. <laughs> the Camaro. Yeah, there's a couple of words that my accent creeps in there. <laughs> um, but you know what? If we put if we put something like a little tiny, you know, like a Datsun or something on a on a uh, truck frame, well, that's what with I said, big massive know. wheels and a four forty engine, that'll be badass. Yeah, no? it'd be different. I could give it that. Yeah. yeah, and then we rhino line the whole damn thing. <laughs> yeah, except for the seats, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just rhino line it. Yeah, I get a little rough on the backside with the rhino line. Yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> then you just hose it all off when you get done. Yeah. So now everyone's going to. So, uh, yeah. So now he was. Uh, so now Rebel Sapper is making fun of, of what I said when I said Camaro. <laughs> what is it? What, what are you supposed to say? Camaro? Camaro. Camaro? Camaro. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like, like a that's just my that's my accent. There's certain things I can't uh, like my my sons laugh when I say London. London? Your London sounds fine. Yeah, they, there's something about when I say London. I don't know what it is. Something about it. Yeah, a little. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe what I don't know. One because I say it both ways, and when I say it's either when I say London or London, one of them cracks them up. So <laughs> now it will be too. Um, yeah. <laughs> you call a wrench a spanner? Um. No, yeah, no. you know, some of those things went away. Like you know, I mean, you know, I used to call elevator a lift. A lift, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All that kind of stuff. Lorry. Truck is a yeah. lorry. You got a new lorry. That's what you got. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a lot of it has gone away. I've been, you know, almost totally Americanized. <laughs> uh, Chris B says, like, cool, quick, cool, whip. Cool, quick. Cool, whip. Whip. Cool, whip. Cool, whip. That's from, that's from uh, Family Guy. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because the little baby with the big massive football yeah. head on Family Guy has like a British accent. He says, Brian, cool Brian? whip. Yeah, cool whip. So, all right. So, what do you, uh, you know, it's, it's, we've been, we've been on for a while. Let's give the, yeah. let's give the, uh, let's give the, the folks out there a break. You want to, what do you want to plug before we end it here? Oh, Facebook, Instagram, you know, the typical stuff. Uh, mower, uh, mower death. Check it out. Stenparts.com. If you're looking for all your Sten part needs, that's right. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I turn on my shot show voice for the 2018 shot show coming up right around the corner. Yeah. And also I mean, in Dallas at the NRA show. <laughs> Annual conventions coming up in Dallas. That's right. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could be you could be a voiceover guy, you know. you and Sam Andrews will do all the voiceovers. Hey there, what are you doing tonight? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Peggy hates this. In a, I can do the move. I can do the movie guy. In a world, <laughs> in a world with no uh, something. In around. a world where Walter has gone crazy. 
Only Hank Strange can save the day. Look at the new grip on the Luger. Okay, I think we're not a magazine anymore. You just put your hand through the frame. You know, it's like yeah, you get those magic ghost bullets in there. Yeah, it's like go. a movie gun. Da, 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 da. They come out of your arm. They feed through. Oh, that'd be a cool thing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Speaking okay, of make movie... it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of movie guns, I have somebody in um, New Zealand that I met that does that. That um wants some of my stuff for movies, so I got to work on that too. So yeah. I don't know if I told you about that or not, but yeah, Vanessa Kitty says she likes Sam's voice. Sam Sam has the voice. He does have a he does have that um he's got that very professional sounding. Yeah, you can't you can't beat Sam has like that somewhat like a old British general, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, Ronco voice. Yeah, the Ron my my Ronco voice. Yeah, for the Ronco yeah. Whopper Chopper or whatever you know. Porno voice. No, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Porno. Yeah, but there's yeah. a porno voice. I don't know if there is such a thing. Yeah. Uh, Luger Skeleton. Uh, okay. Anyways, are we gonna? Are all right. We... Yeah. So let's uh, you let's wrap it up. We'll we'll come back with uh, your because you've got the uh, the Trump roosters in, right? Yep. 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 So yep. one of the days this week we'll come back on and we'll have the Trump roosters. Who's coming in? Uh, I think we've got Cre we got Krebs tomorrow night, people. Ooh, 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 Mark Krebs. So Mark Krebs, are you gonna be here for Krebs? I could be here. I'll, yeah. I'll I'll be good. I'll listen and be quiet. Yeah, yeah. We might we might get El Tenda. We'll definitely should be ah. getting Krebs. So we'll be back probably around. The, what is it starting at seven? Same time seven. So Can that's what we it? have. Yeah, that's what we have going on. Um, that's going on tomorrow. Mark Krebs tonight. Okay. So let me thank everyone that's been hanging out with us. We got a bunch of folks still hanging out with us, even though we're up to all kinds of crazy shenanigans. You know, so I want to thank you guys for for hanging with us for all the good questions and being uh, you know patient while we were um, hanging out with our friend Jeff Quinn from Gun Blast. Thanks again to Gun Blast for coming on the show. It was really cool to come spend all that time answer our questions and everything. Really good dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, don't forget to uh, like, share, subscribe. Know. Yeah, don't forget to. Don't forget to uh, like this video, of course, and share it and subscribe and all that kind of stuff. I want to thank everyone that sponsors us. That would be, you know, starting with Safety Harbor Firearms, this guy right here, you know, and his lovely wife that was just in there and the rest of the whole family. And, uh, of course, you know, Rand CLP, Andrew's Custom Leather, and Big Daddy Guns. Daddy Guns. Check it out right there somewhere. Let me see if I can put my finger right there, the Big Daddy Guns. That's a big finger. <laughs> yeah. That gives us the bandwidth and all that cool stuff so that we can do this. Um, and, of course, I want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. You know, we uh, need the Patreon support. There's more and more videos every day that YouTube sends us messages and goes, these videos will never be monetized. Yeah. They, they yeah. Do, you know the other night we did the 22 show, Walter? Yeah. For some reason, they demonetized that forever. There's something that we did that was wrong in that 22 show. <laughs> I can't remember. They're, they're mad about something in that 22 show. They also uh, like. They also don't like the, the, the video... The, sh the uh, show that we did where we were talking about the alt-right and the alt-left. Uh, they had any problem with the alt-right talk, but they didn't like the alt-left talk. It's controversial, yes. Controversial. Yeah. So, um, Less you know, we, yeah, we, we appreciate the support from everyone that supports us on Patreon. Okay, that's it. And you know what? Let, oh, let me remind folks, you know, we are on iTunes. I'm putting up uh, five more episodes. should be going up on iTunes sometime very soon. So I think we're, we'll be up to like 45 episodes on iTunes. So you can listen to us. Don't forget to like when you listen to those iTunes episodes, don't forget to leave us a review so that we can get into the what's new category. That will be a cool thing that will help highlight what we're doing. And uh, that's it, man. Any last words? Be civil. All right. Be civil. You heard that from Walter. Peace. Be civil.